So I actually went live on time. That's impressive for me. So um, I think I've got everything in place. I'm just going to cut some more um, tape for the uh, identifiers for the halfway point. And then I'll get started again on the uh, uh, wrapping them up. Sorry, I was kind of rushing around trying to get everything set up where it was supposed to be. All right. So I'm just going to pre-stage some of these here on the edge of the Takadai. I know I'm not really in camera right now. So, And Danny did say she would be on. Uh, I did send her the link, but I didn't see if she got it or not. So I might have to resend it to her. But I'm going at least two hours, possibly three or more. I don't have to be up in the morning for work. So I got a uh, nice uh, time frame to be able to work on this. And I think I can also run a stream on Saturday, which would probably get me to where I would need to be to have everything set up. All right. Still staging some more tape here. Oops. I just realized I don't have a... Good display up here. Let me switch this around real quick. There we go. Now you can see better what it is I'm going to be doing. Sorry if the braiding frame, I'm mean, not braiding, the uh, warping frame is a little out of focus. But, uh, ooh, we're up to 10 people already. That's pretty impressive. Hey, Dragon Angel, nice to see you on. Uh, I th think this is your first time on the stream. If uh, I'm mistaken, I apologize. I'm unfortunately really lousy with names, um, but I try and greet uh, new people on the stream who uh, are live for the first time, uh, or on the live for the first time, whatever the proper grammar for that is. I do have my headphones in so I can hear if anybody joins the stream. And hey, Philip Martin, nice to see you on. All right, we're getting close here to getting on screen. So we have 12 of the 84 Thomas set up. For some reason, at the end of the last stream, I think I said it was 16, but it's actually 12. We have three sets of four instead of four sets of four. Okay. Or uh, six sets of two. Let me go ahead and greet everybody real quickly. So there's Dragon Angel. Gwen, Marmar, nice to see you on as usual. Uh, Philip Martin, Kathleen Fraser, nice to see you. And hey, Lin Lady Ninja, I think this is your uh, second time back here. All right. I've had dinner, I've had caffeine. Let's pre stage some Tama. And then we'll be ready for the next one. All right, so blue is the next one I need to do. All right, come up right here. Oh, hey, I hear somebody. Let's go ahead and add them. Hey, hey Danny, nice boy. to see you on stream. Woo, there we go. I'm in the shot. Yep. <laughs> oh, this is hey. so exciting. I've, I've been so excited to watch this from the start. Okay. Well, um, I got my tape pre-staged, so I'm going to just jump in to uh, uh, go ahead and make sure I got all the, yep, all the threads are still in. Last time I uh, actually had some pull out, but this has actually been working uh, quite well. Um, do I think, yeah, a uh, couple threads cut here. Oh, it's in your face. Yep. Um, I'm not really that shy. It's just I'm trying to focus on what it is I'm doing, so I'm not too worried about that either way. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yep. Um, one of the things I did uh, want to mention to you is I've, uh, I think I've told somebody else online, but I did uh, mention the story about uh, wanting to tell you um, how for my first anniversary, I hired my wife, a divorce attorney. She, I'm uh, sorry. Say that again. So for 
my first wedding anniversary, I hired my wife, a divorce attorney. Oh, um, that's so sweet. Yep. Um, <coughs> uh, her ex, um, they've been together like about 15 or 16 years and they bought a house together, but they only got married about a year prior to, uh, uh getting, uh, separated. And, uh, she was actually willing to let him have the house if, if, if he would just refinance it in his own name. Mm -hmm. um, but after about a year or so, he hadn't done that. Actually, it was about two years because I got married about a year after I met her. I know that was kind of quick, but uh, the uh, um, we were having an issue because we were talking to different people and they were all saying, well, you, you had to address this in divorce. And it was like, no, this was like joint property prior to the divorce. And wasn't covered by it because it, they both owned it prior to getting married in the first place. And uh, we finally had to actually hire a divorce attorney who understood the issues at stake. And um, we basically uh, said we were going to sue for a petition. And he went ahead and um, arranged for the sale of the house at that time at probably about only two thirds of market value. But hey, at least it got him separated. Because. Yeah, uh, her comment was that he would probably be a good father um, once he actually grew up himself, and she just didn't want to spend that time raising him. So, but uh, my wife is does have a tendency to be snarky. I like All that. Right. That's so, so much fun. Yep. Um, so you were wanting to ask questions about how I got started in this. Yeah. How did you get started and what attracted you to it? And hey, by the way, everybody in the chat, I do see some folks are here. Go ahead and leave a like on the stream if you haven't already. It helps It helps our man out here in the algorithm and it will really uh, support his channel. So if you could do that, that'd be sweet. Um, so yeah, how did you get started in this? How did you learn about it? What, what interested you about your craft? Okay. I have been a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism for about I think probably close to 30, um, yeah, almost 40, yeah, almost 40 years at this point. I, 84 was my first event. Um, Jeff was actually uh, playing in Salt Lake about the time I was uh, fairly active in the area. So we, I think we've met up in person at some time, but it was like, you know, early 90s. Because um, oh, wow. I was living in Idaho at the time. Uh, but anyway, uh, I went to a big event um, in Western Pennsylvania called the Penzik War. And uh, one of the people I had met there who's part of the household I was in um, came up and I just realized I forgot something here. <laughs> I forgot to do the halfway mark. Give me a second. I got to take care of that. Um, no worries. But, it's um, distracting when uh, someone's asking you questions and you're having to use your hands and doing other stuff. So I get it. Yeah. At least I... Uh, uh, caught it before I got too far on and I can easily fix this. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, um, she came up to me, handed me a disc that was cut from the side of a 12 pack of Coca-Cola and it had notches in it. And she handed me a couple of skeins of DMC floss and said, here, I think you'd like this and proceeded to teach me how to do Kumihimo on a disc. And, uh, um, that was like 1998, and I started doing it on the Maradai, which is the round wood stand, uh, shortly thereafter. And uh, I think by like 2002, I was building my first Takadai. Uh, wow. So. That's, in, that's a lot of investment. Like, I, I know that you had posted um, that this, all of the silk that you had just ordered was about $700 worth of thread. When, when did you decide, okay, yeah, this is, this is going to be, you know, a hobby I really invest myself in because I know for me, I switch hobbies all the time and I think it's because of my ADHD. So I'm always amazed when people can commit themselves to doing something new. So at what point, like in your growth or in your skills, did you say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to up my game and start doing more. Um, actually in this particular case, it was probably about two years ago. I mean, I've been doing this, uh, semi-continually, but I'd take like a year or two off and I'd be doing other things as well. Uh, cause I'm also that way. Uh, I mean, when I was in, uh, grade school and junior high, I played like five different band instruments over about a six year period. 
Wow. Uh, which was kind of fun trying to have to, you know, learn each new instrument. And of course, at this point, I can't even read music anymore. <laughs> I bet you could. I bet you could if you sat down with like maybe a hymn book, you know, like very simple time structures and like very simple melodies. It would take you about two seconds and then you'd be back in the swing of things. Yeah. Well, I also uh, in the uh, middle to 90s to about 2000, I had a neo-Celtic harp I would play, but I oh. couldn't read the music. I was basically memorizing the music and then uh, repeating it type thing. Um and then uh, about four years ago, I tried picking up the flute, and I got a moderate ways, but not too far. But this is something I've continually done for a long time, and a friend of mine wanted a braid that would uh, um, say something on it, and this is the type of braiding technique that lets me do that. So I figured, yeah, I could do that. So I made the jump to actually uh, learning how to do this particular style of uh, braiding, as, you know, the pickup where you can like design what you're doing um, yeah. and write, you know, whatever two color design you want. And uh, let's make sure. Okay. I got that the right way. Um, and I got fairly serious at it. And about the time I was uh, watching a lot of uh, uh, Nick Ricada's streams and mm -hmm. he was talking about to somebody and saying like the first hundred uh, subscribers on YouTube is the hardest part of a, uh, uh, you know, building up a channel and uh, making it on YouTube. It's like, well, I've had my channel since like 2006 and I've got about 200 subscribers now. So apparently overnight over the course of like a decade and a half, I managed to get that part without really paying attention. So let's see what could happen if I actually dedicate myself to doing it. And it's like, what, um, uh, sorry, I think got to think for a second here, make sure I'm doing this the right way. Nope, I I'll wasn't. let you okay. think. Oh, no, it's it's I just have to visually look and make sure I'm doing it correctly. Um, but uh, so I was thinking, what can I do that, you know, would be interesting that I could do regularly where it wouldn't like uh, um, be a struggle every day to come up with something to do? And it's like, you know what? Um, I bet a lot of people would like to see or learn how to do the uh, um, um, the pickup rating and or just. Uh, Kumihimo in general and it's like okay I've done it long enough I know I can keep up with it it's not going to like bore me over time mm -hmm. and I figured hey I think I can do this so it's been about a little over a year since I decided to do that and I'm right about 1180 uh, in subscribers and I'm probably about six weeks out at the current rate from getting monetized. Hey so. congratulations hopefully we can get you there because yeah you've been really dedicated to this for a long time. And I mean, I, I enjoy watching your stuff, especially when I'm sitting there drafting, um, you know, pleadings and things that it's just more uh, procedural and, you know, making sure that I put the right, the right things where they're supposed to be. Obviously, sometimes I have to put a little more thought into it. But, you know, when I'm doing kind of more monotonous work, it's really nice to have something playing in the background. And I really enjoy watching. So, so what is it that you're doing right now? I'm uh, setting up uh, for the, uh, um, basically I have to pre-stage all of the threads. And so you can, you know, theoretically like start it and then go a little ways till it looks nice and then just, you know, um, come out the end to where it, uh, um, it looks like, you know, the same on both ends. But um, I like it for like having a ring or something like this where you can hang it or in this case, like, you know, using belts and whatnot. Uh -huh. um, and to do that, I need to do what's called a flat start. So I've got to essentially uh, pre-weave the first uh, triangle of it as it gets all the way in place before I can start actually braiding it. And that's what I'm doing right now. I've got 84 uh, Tama I need to put on here. And... Um, how okay. do you calculate how many Tama you need and and how many like separate? Is a Tama I'm taking it the number of threads or is that the? This this is a Tama. That's uh, the it's Tama. Okay. It's basically just a weight. Um, I see. So uh, let's see. Since you've seen the rest of it, uh, these are called coma. They're basically just okay. pin blocks. 
um, and the front of it where it's the uh, uh, the Tory Gate, uh, and those are about all the uh, specifically Japanese names that I remember about it, and I'm trying to use regularly. Uh, but uh, okay, all right, yeah, I uh, think I've got it now. But the way I can double check um, that I've got it right is that uh, when I put it through here, it should like an look like an over under weave. And yep, that's looking correct now. So I got it. Um, and I, but yeah, what I'm doing here is that uh, I have to get all 84 set up. And the way I know how many I'm going to be doing, yeah, you can see here that it's got the over and under where it should. Yeah. Except no, I've still done this in reverse. I'm not sure why I'm having the issue with that. Um, it's because I showed up and started asking questions. <laughs> No worries. Um, you were on track before I showed up and was like, so how, do, how how many Tama do you have? What is a Tama? How do you know how many you have? Like, I'm impressed that you remember that question while you're explaining other things, because I am the worst when I get interviewed. As soon as someone asks me a question, it goes through my head. I think of the answer and then I don't say it out loud while I'm waiting for them to finish their question. And then I forget what it was they asked me. And mm -hmm. so... I, I think it takes tremendous intelligence and patience to be able to wait. Ooh, okay. So this is your planner. This is what you would show me for the design. And right. If you look up here in the corner, see where it says 84 yep. Tama? That uh -huh. lets me know what I'm doing here. And basically it goes up eight at a time. So I can switch it over to like uh, 92 and it's a little bit wider. And then I go to like a uh, hundred and it just keeps uh, expanding it out. It gives me more pixels, but the issue I have uh, currently with uh, the the Takadai or the braiding stand I'm on now is that if I um, go over um, about 100, I don't have enough room to have enough pin blocks on it to keep going. So uh, to expand beyond that, I've got to build a new Takadai to take advantage of it. Someone in your chat, uh, Gwendolyn SS says, I like to tat while I watch Torin braid. That's that's okay. awesome. <laughs> I yeah. love I love that there's other creatives who are doing things while observing other people create things. That's cool. Yep. And uh, um, okay, I think I figured out what I was doing wrong. So, yep, that matches them now. The way the rest of them look. Um, yeah. Um, also, Ian has mentioned that he likes to listen to me when he's uh, drafting uh, stuff. So uh, the weirdest thing about doing this is how many people have told me that it's soothing to listen to my voice. And while I can you know, intellectually understand it, it just kind of freaks me out mentally. It's like I never expected anybody to tell me that. So, all right, there we go. That's, no one says oh, look, that about okay. my voice. <laughs> Although okay, I do a really great Karen voice, so. Okay. Let me go ahead and uh, switch to this view real quick so people can see what I'm talking about here. All right. So let's see. All right. So that's in focus. So you can see it's like an over, under, over, under uh, going on in there. Yeah. And so now I've got it right. And uh, so, yeah, the uh, the one going to the right has to be on the top or going over to my right side. Uh, it's also the camera's right side because I try to uh, set this up to where people could see what I'm seeing while I'm doing it. So, because I do want to, you know, get people to learn how to do this. So, let me quickly see if there's anything in chat I need to. I'm probably going to have to like go back over the chat later and see what people have said. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of dreading when I finally am large enough, I'm not able to keep up with chat because <laughs> a lot of what I do is responding to people's questions. You know, I'm not very large. My, or I am, but my channel's not very large and I still can't keep up. Like it is, it is really tough filtering questions, like making sure that you acknowledge everybody and, and thank everyone. You know, once it starts to pick up, it's just hard to keep track of everything. Do you ever, okay, so this was a question that's been burning in my soul since I first saw you at work. Do you ever feel like a spider? Um, not exactly, uh, but uh, 
when I've come up, when I've tried to come up with like uh, thumbnails using Mid Journey for uh, uh, the streams, uh, I've been trying to do like you know um, spider, you know, in a spider web type thing, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, all the images either look horrible or you know like too frightening to show on in public. <laughs> You kind of remind me, have you ever seen um, Spirited Away? Um, sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't think I have. There's this character in Spirited Away where um, she comes down to like the broiler and the guy has like six different arms or eight arms. I think he's supposed to look a little bit like a spider. Anyway, it's a Japanese animation and it kind of reminds me of what you're doing where it just feels like I understand that you have a method to this and you only need two hands. But seeing all of these beautiful silk threads everywhere, I'm like, oh, you have to, you know, there's so much thought and thoughtfulness that goes into each and everything you do. I'm just massively impressed. Well, I spent probably about two or three hours today at work thinking about ways that I can improve this braiding stand. And I think I've come up with something because um, I've been want, since I've been enjoying uh, braiding with silk uh, as much as I have lately. Um, sorry, for some of the uh, white cones here, the thread gets wrapped around the base and then it won't unspool. And it's mm. trying to figure out which one is binding. It's causing me the problem. Um, so, but, uh, but yeah, I've, I've come up with an idea, which basically I'm going to take, uh, some plastic, uh, and route out a couple or drill some holes so that I can guide it a little bit better, but I should be able to get a lot more, um, threads through it than what I currently have with just the binder clips I'm using. Fun fact. Did you know that hummingbirds use spider web silk to build their nests? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so they'll it's a go nice around. Strong fiber. It is a strong fiber, fiber, fiber. So it's fun to see. Oh, someone in the chat says, uh, "Marmar says his name is Kamadi." I wish I could post pictures in the chat. This is referring to the Spirited Away reference. Yep, that is it. Okay. It's Kamadi. Okay, I will have to check it out. I do like watching anime, uh, but my main thing is finding time to like sit down and watch. I can been, definitely uh, relate. Yep, I've uh, been making a concerted effort to try and uh, make my way through the live action One Piece. I'm oh, how is it? In. It's really enjoyable. Um, it's, I think they did a pretty good job of trying to adapt the fill of an anime. Um, and a lot of people I respect who watch more of it say that uh, they did a really good adaptation. They were faithful to the uh, essence of the story, if not all the details. Because, you know, they're doing like a adaptation of 20 years of manga. But they don't do it all in the first season. It's like the first story arc that they're doing. So, but I'm glad I, that they're not doing that. Yep. Yeah, um, the, uh, uh, the same studio that's doing it is the one that did cow the live action Cowboy Bebop. But this time around, the creator uh, of One Piece has creative control on it. So that seems oh, to have done uh, a lot to make it a much better show than it could have been. That's great. Because, yeah, anime doesn't always translate well to live action. Some could absolutely translate extremely well to live action. Like, I've been a huge proponent for making a Gundam Wing movie since I was a kid. Like, I would love to see that. Because most of Gundam Wing is not, not robots fighting each other in space, which that is a large part of it, but most of it's actually the drama and the interpersonal relationships and everybody's different, you know, goals and ambitions kind of coalescing and opposing one another and fighting like that's, that's fun. I really enjoy that part. So I feel like that could be a really great adaptation if done well. Hey, do you mind? You actually just gave me an idea. My dog had, a um, just got neutered and he's super, super needy and I have him in his kennel and he's really annoyed by it because he has his cone on. Mm -hmm. And I realized I could leash him to the door with his like non-retractable leash. Mm -hmm. And he won't be able to access the rest of my office to destroy it. So give me two seconds and I will be right back. Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay. Let's see. 
me see if I can move this a little bit better where you folks can see because I would, oh, that's why it's having an issue. The uh, cord is catching on the, or the camera is catching on the Maradai. Okay, so. And I have a slightly smaller window here due to the fact that I have three, uh, three windows on screen at the same time. All right, so. I think if I do this properly, I should be able to get back in the swing of it. Um, but I figure with the stream tonight and uh, maybe a stream on Saturday, I'll be ready to start braiding then. So let's move this back over. There we go. Let's move it up just a little bit. There we go. And just got to remember to mark the halfway point. Okay, that's why it looked weird. It uh, one of the threads stuck on the tape, so let me roll this back out a little bit, get them pulled even again, so it's not an issue. All right, there we go. I know you can't see it all, but uh, there we go. Glad to hear the puppers is doing well. If uh, a little bit frustrated. <laughs> He's just fine. He's just a big baby. He's been, you know, it's weird because I trained him pretty well. He's only five months old. And, you know, we had him to the point where we could leave him in his kennel for about an hour or two and he'd settle down. He'd be OK. And uh, now, you know, we put him in his kennel for three minutes and he's like, Mom, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done mom and and like even today i came home to work and i was working on my laptop and i'm sitting there talking to my clients about you know pretty serious things involving their divorce and my dog is sitting there pawing at me and growling at me and barking trying to get my attention i'm like dude when did you pick this up so he'll get yeah. better he'll he'll kind of calm down i think it's just you know post-surgery he's just extra needy, I think. Yeah, I, I can understand that. It's a major change, and they've only got five months of uh, experience to balance it against. Right. Yeah. Do you have any pets? We actually have seven cats. Um, six Ooh. of them belong to my wife and I, and one of them belongs to um, uh, our roommate. Um, and yes, we joke that we have the crazy cat lady starter pack. Um, <laughs> the reason we have as many as we do is my wife said, you know, she'd like a cat at some point. Um, and uh, we had a feral cat living in our backyard and she gave birth to a litter of kittens. And we figured, you know what, we should get them caught and get them, yeah, you know, minimum get them fixed, see if we can get her fixed. So we caught the kittens. Uh, we managed to give a few of them away and we had some of them. Um, but she wound up having 19 kittens over a what? year and a half, over four litters. Oh and my God. That's so hard. Cause once they start, right. Yeah. It's so hard to stop that, that cycle. My yep. cat, it was like, we couldn't get her neutered. It was every time we turned around, she was pregnant again you know, as soon as she was done giving birth. And so it was just like, ah, and the, the doctors were always like, well, let's wait. She just gave birth. And so we wait a week and she's pregnant again. Yeah. Well, in this case, since she's a feral, she was a feral cat living in our backyard and the neighbor's yard and the other neighbor's yard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we couldn't catch her. Um, I mean, she would, we would feed her so she'd stay in the area and she'd keep the squirrels away but we couldn't get her to actually um, any place we could catch her. We got to have a heart trap and she would go in, she'd eat the food and she'd go out. And we even, uh, uh, you know, like snuck up around the other side of the house to, um, you know, startle her. So she triggered the trap and she wouldn't do it. So um, what we wound up doing then, um, I got a cheap radio controlled car tied the trigger to a string and the other end of the car, I sat out the corner of the yard. And when I saw her going in the trap, I triggered the car and caught her that way. So we mm. finally got her fixed and uh, she still hangs around. She's actually looking nice and healthy now. 
Um, she still won't let us get anywhere near her, but uh, she's um, she's happy in the neighborhood. She keeps the squirrels away, um, and um, so as a result, we have five cats from her litters. Uh, we were able to get most of them other homes, um, and we have one that we got when we were camping. Uh, apparently, somebody dropped their cat off at the campground. Oh. The owners of the campground had a cat of their own that was not getting along well, and we figured if we left him, he probably wouldn't be around much longer. So since he didn't belong to anybody, we took him home. Though apparently he'd been fixed, but he wasn't microchipped. So, um, And then uh, our roommate, when she moved uh, back in with us uh, after coming back from Texas, she had a small Siamese uh, that... Uh, that's her cat. So we have a total of seven. Um, one of them I did a short of recently. Uh, we call him Cuddlebug because his perfect place in the universe is in my lap at my computer chair. And he wants to be up there about every 15 minutes. He doesn't want to really Aww. do anything else. But yeah, he's, he's very affectionate to me, but he doesn't like some of the other cats. So uh, we try and keep him as happy as we can. But uh, the reason we call him Cuddlebug the Cyborg Kitty is about three to four years ago, uh, we think he was jumping down from his hiding spot in our basement rafters and caught his foot um, in one of the wire storage racks we have. Oh, and no. And broke, broke all of his metatarsals on oh, his my left goodness. rear foot. So we took him to the vet, and they said, yeah, you're going to need to see an orthopedic vet for this. It's not going to heal on its own. And the orthopedic vet said, yeah, uh, we can do it. Or you can, you know, if you want, you can amputate. But the amputation costs and the, the getting the leg fixed were close enough together. It's like, he's only 70 years old. He needs as much of an active life as he can. So we had his leg pinned with uh, four millimeter titanium pins. And after about the first, like, five months or so after the surgery, he's back to normal. He shows no sign of having any pain. He's really active. He jumps up around and on to everything. So, wow, well, but, that's uh, awesome. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, that's pretty much our pets. Uh, I used to have um, Colombian boas for a while, but uh, when we got cats, it was like um, I'm not going to get any more because that's not fair to the boa because we can't let it out anymore. And we don't want to risk any of the cats. So when the last one I had passed away old age, um, I didn't get any more of them. But, How uh, long do boas typically live? Um, about 20 years, ideally. Mine lasted about 15. Um, I got my, the last one I got was like in uh, 2001. So hmm. uh, I, I have about a question. A that everyone probably is thinking right now. I'm, I'm sure I'm not going on. How many times have your cats gotten into your threads? Um, once. Um, we The cat that we let up here doesn't uh -huh. what, is not interested in chewing on threads. The one that is got up here once when I had the uh, first um, uh, custom design one on the Takadai, and it was had like about eight months that it, I didn't work on it. Um, and he chewed, he chewed through a couple of the threads. Uh, they were silk on that too. So, and he didn't actually get a large chunk of it. He just kind of chewed them through. So we think he was, you know, and he hasn't shown any problems since then. So he's okay. But yeah, we try not to have any of the cats that like chewing things up here. And I try not to have anything uh, downstairs that they might go through. And the uh, round discs, uh, if we put a uh, like a pillow cover over, a yeah, pillow cover over it, it keeps the uh, uh, the fancy stuff out of the way, and they don't really go after it then. So, but oh, yeah, that's cool. I was trying to be really careful not to, you know, have any of it. It wasn't so much that I was worried about them uh, damaging what I was doing. I just don't want them to get hurt. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I uh, my puppy dog he just went and looked in the mirror and didn't recognize himself with the cone on and started barking at himself. So I apologize. I had to, I had to uh, tell him no. <laughs> no worries. And I'm not worried if there's like some background barking on uh, the stream that doesn't bother me. Um, 
the uh, yeah, when Cuddlebug had a cone on, we had wound up having to take it off right away because he drools and he was drooling oh. so much. It's like if we don't take the cone off, he's gonna have you know, like uh, sores or whatever from it being so wet. Uh, oh. but, uh, he also didn't like chew on his legs or anything like that, so it wasn't a major problem for him, fortunately. Oh, that's good. Yeah, my dog chews on everything. As a matter of fact, his his mouthing is part of the reason why we decided to have him neutered is because I was a little bit concerned that some of his mouthing behaviors might become aggressive um, Okay. Yeah. as his testosterone really started to kick in. And he was already having some, you know, male dominant type display behavior that he didn't have when he was a little, little puppy, obviously. So, yeah. Yeah, we just decided, you know what, we're not going to be breeding them. So why the heck, why the heck not? And yep. in November, we're going to Korea. Okay. And so we, the soonest they could get them in to be neutered was in November. And so when I got the call, actually, while I was streaming with uh, Runkle, I said, oh my goodness, I have to take this call. It's because it was the vet and they were calling to say, hey, we had a cancellation. Can you get them in tomorrow? So it's never perfect timing, but at least we were able to get him in and get him neutered quickly. Because by the time we were going to be, let's see, November, he would have been seven months old. And I think it would have been even harder for him to have lost his lost his male parts then. So I think five yeah. months is appropriate for his his breed, too. So Okay. Yeah. We're well, if I was a little bit ahead of schedule, I probably could have given you Jeff's braid, too, to take with you. But... Fortunately, he apparently now has a uh, P.O. box that uh, stuff can get sent to him. He does. And I do, too. And I'm, I'm thinking I might put it on hold just for a minute because I haven't been getting as much uh, as many wonderful, generous gifts in the mail as of late or at least for a month or so. And so I'm like, eh, might as well just, you know, put it on hold, come back and start it up again soon. Yeah, I had to... Uh... I uh, get a post office box because I'm a constable and I'd like to have, you know, a uh, safe uh, mailbox for if I get like a, a request from a lawyer to do a uh, service for a civil case. So I just don't want that leaving out in my post, uh, my, uh, my uh, regular uh, mailbox because our postal carriers where I'm at really kind of suck. We regularly get mail for our neighbors. Hmm. That sucks. Yeah, and as a constable, you definitely want your own P.O. box or something, some kind of other address to be connected to you. Yeah. I could never be a constable. I could never do service. Like, I I think about serving people and my stomach drop. Sorry, yeah. my dog is like, he's had it today. He's been just hanging out with me because um, daddy, Mr. On, is down in uh, Vegas temporarily. He's just going to do some business down there, and so I've been taking care of him for a day and he's already done with me. He's like, don't look at me. Don't touch me. You never play with me. You just do your work all day. Huh, buddy. Yeah. So have you, uh, have you ever owned a dog? Um, yes. Um, not as an adult, but I've had roommates who've had dogs. And when I was growing up, we had uh, two dogs, uh, actually three, but I don't really remember the first one. Cause I was like about, uh, three when it passed away. Um, but uh, when I uh, when I was younger, we had a dog that was a half poodle, half dingo mix. Whether that's actually the case or not, that's what our, my parents told us. Um, that sounds like a crazy mix. Yeah. Um, he looked, you know, or she looked just kind of like a, a mutt with, um, you know, kind of a uh, tan brown hair that was kind of shaggy. Um, Having seen dingoes and poodles, I'm not sure how that mix actually works out or not, but uh, she was a very good dog. Um, and then uh, when she was about uh, probably about four or five, my mom got another one, which was a uh, Maltese because she wanted Aww. a fancy dog that did not shed a lot. Uh, he was a really happy dog. He did bark more than I think my mom expected, but um, they're yappy dogs for sure. Any, yep. any small dog. I'm, I'm always amazed when people get small dogs and they're like, why does it keep barking? I'm like, because <laughs> it's little. Everything in the world intimidates a little dog. Everything. Yep. Huh? And then they think they're big dogs, which is hilarious. My dog, his favorite dog breeds to hang out with are the big ones. So 
I'll take him to the dog park. He has zero interest hanging out with his own kind or anyone who's smaller than him. He's like, let me go get beat up by the big dogs, I guess. So, yeah. Well, the, um, oops, this one didn't hold in the clip. There. That's quick fix. Um, the uh, um, most amusing thing about the Maltese, um, my mom wanted to name him Jean Pierre, and we all just called him Cotton. So that's what he got referred to as because he looked like a cotton ball. <laughs> but uh, his claim to fame was that uh, we trained him to do. Uh, roll over on command if we would give him popcorn. And he got so enthused at it that he would actually do mid-air mid -air barrel rolls uh, when, he, when we gave him the command to roll over. Oh, that's so cute. I love so. that. My my dog doesn't do mid-air barrel rolls. We just taught him to play dead. And it's hilarious because he's a little like a little Korean gangster because we'll say it in Korean, right? We'll be like, boom, jiggle which means like die. <laughs> and he, had, he does the best dramatic deaths because he's a schnauzer. So everything has to be dramatic for him. So. Yep. And now what was that sound? Was that your camera being scooted? Yeah, I've, uh, uh, I've got a uh, boom I made for the, the close-up camera that I made out of scrap from PVC at work. And, uh, oh, wow. One of the things about being a machinist and working at a shop that does uh, machines plastics is there's usually uh, scraps or spare parts that you could turn into useful pro uh, projects that uh, are essentially free because it's just going in the recycle. And since nice. we don't get paid for our recycle um, where we're at, um, it's, you know, they have no problem at all if I take it. Um, yeah, that's one of the things I've really enjoyed the last couple of years. I used to work at another machine shop, and after about 20 years, I was just fed up with them. Um, I mean, I was the uh, I worked there as a machinist, then as quality, then some other stuff, and then I became the uh, assistant IT guy. Uh, then I went back to uh, doing the machining when the uh, recession hit back in 2009. And in about 2015, the IT guy passed away. And so they had me take over and did that for about three years. And then they uh, hired a guy as a consultant and they asked me if I had an issue, if he wound up being hired full time. Yep. No problem. Find out about six months after that, they hired him as my boss and never told me. Oh, I hate that. Oh, that's tacky. Worse than that. He was like a super micromanager. Um, and I probably have undiagnosed attention deficit. I'm actually trying to get tested for that. So uh, they're about a year out where I am to get testing, but you'll, you'll probably understand this. Um, I don't deal well if I get interrupted in the middle of a concentrated task. Um, so, you know, I'm going along and I get an email and I have to respond to it and then I have to get back. Okay. Where was I? I need to start back up again. So uh, finally, after we hashed out that, yes, he is my boss. Um, it's like, okay, if I email you, at every, you know, every time I complete something, will you not email me near as much? And he said, yes. <laughs> and about two weeks later, I realized the amount of emails I was getting from him had tripled. Are you kidding? No, I am not. Each email usually generated a response asking for more details. And then he would ask about something else. And it was just like, um, uh, and given the corporate environment there, it was like, I just do not need this. So I went back on the shop floor. Um, I almost got fired over that too. Jeez. So the, part of the agreement was that my um, uh, going back on the shop floor, I would not be doing any IT work. And uh -huh. I said, well, they still wanted me to do some stuff. And, you know, uh, would that be okay? And I said, yeah, I can do extra stuff, but you need to pay me as a consultant. Right. So, I mean, I, I was getting paid like, you know, low twenty dollars an hour. So I had a you know, you know, IT consultant work. Um, I'd be doing it for like a hundred dollars an hour, you know, half hour minimum, and we were paying other consultants to come in at like one hundred eighty bucks an hour. So it's not like I was overcharging them for my specialized expertise in our environment. And uh, they said, "Well, you got to sh show up at this meeting," and it's like, "Okay, well, are you going to pay me this?" It's like, "Well, show up at the meeting. And we'll talk about it." Are you going to pay me my rate? 
uh, just show up at the meeting. Okay, you're not paying me my rate. I'm not going to the meeting. And then the uh, CFO came out, grabbed my keys. They closed out all my accounts. And he said, well, I guess you can say, stay. They're telling me you're doing good stuff out here. Oh, my gosh. I would lose it. Oh. And that's the last he said to me for like about a year and a half. <clears throat> so the place I'm at now, um, I was on a uh, local gun forum. And one of the guys there said, hey, you know, if you're interested, stop by our shop, take a look. And uh, I did like about a six week period where I worked at both places for a bit. And it was so much better that it's like, you know what, it's not even uh, not even a question. They're willing to hire me on at like four bucks an hour more just out of the gate. And uh, um, the. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, trying to think of two things at once. Sorry about that. That's um, OK. Yep. So they were hired four bucks an hour more. And um, one of the things that I was also having an issue with is that after I went back on the shop floor, I said I wanted to do programming. And yeah, we'll train you eventually on that. Um, and the pandemic hit and the uh, uh, cam software we used went from uh, having uh, you know paid classes to where they did free online training. So I um, asked if they could, you know, add me on to uh, their acceptable email address to get the training from, and they didn't do anything for a couple of months. So I did it myself and um, got certified and whatnot. And by the time I left there, I asked them, um, you know, before I made my final decision, is there any plans on, you know, letting me do any programming? This is like a year after I'd got myself certified. And they said, eh, it's probably at least a year out for that. And it's like, okay, yep, thank you for letting making this such an easy decision. Oh, I, what a dumb come Like, that's such a loss to them, I would think. Yeah, but I, I'm really happy at the new place. Uh, I mean, it's a much smaller place. There's only like about maybe 15 employees. And it's a family business. But uh, they, uh, it's, like, if I have a, an appointment I need to go to, I just let them know a few days in advance, and it's not a big deal. Previous place, they had, like, an attendance bonus system. And unless you took, like, at least half a day of vacation for anything, you would lose your quarterly attendance bonus and a chance at the yearly attendance bonus. And the, the stress levels related are just, oh, so much different. Oh, so. man. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you're in a better spot now. Yeah, I'm, I'm a lot happier. That's so. honestly, that's everything. If you're happy, that's, that's what life is all about. Yep. That and having a dog try and rip your sock off your foot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I wasn't expecting him to be this disruptive. He was uh, pretty good all day. And then he decided, you know what? I think I'll terrorize mom while she's screaming instead of, you know, not doing that. Well, on the plus side, it's actually uh, going rather smoothly. This is a lot faster than my uh, previous method. Um, and I know I, I have a lot of silk here, but uh, this is actually enough silk for somewhere between like 14 and 20 separate braids. Wow. So it's more I'm investing in the future to yeah. uh, uh, do it. And like uh, I can, I'll be able to add colors one at a time, though. Uh, Jeff's braid is going to have like two new colors. But he's got like a one, probably one color overlap with the one I'm going to do for Larry Korea. Jeez, what um, what colors did Jeff end up cho uh, choosing for his? He's doing yellow and green. Oh, um, all right. Haven't finalized the design with him, but I'm pretty close. Uh, I do want to do like a one more element, like Godzilla. Um, oh, fun! But uh, uh, if after I do this one, I will br I'll, uh, bring up the uh, uh, the design I sent him so you can see what it is that I'm going to be doing for him. Oh, that will be awesome. I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it about the, the, the technique you're using now that's different from before? Um, the, the last time I set up, what I did instead of uh, getting the cones, um, I wound... Um, from a single cone onto a bunch of uh, spools. Uh, let me, I can show you real quick. Um, 
one of these. So I had to okay. do 12 of these for each color. And uh, the problem with that is that once I get them, it takes a while to wind them on. And it's hard to get an exact amount because um, I have to go by the RPMs of the drill I was using to wind them and how long I did it. I got mostly enough for everything, but I got a lot more of the red and not quite enough of the silver for, um, for Rob's braid. And it really did not want to come off the spools. I had to fight mm -hmm. it all the way. Um, so the fact that uh, this is, you know, even with the, the, the cones that occasionally have it wrap around the base, um, this is so much nicer and faster. I'm able, I'm easily working twice as fast as I did on the last one. So awesome. That's awesome to hear. So I always feel bad when people sacrifice and do things for me. And I, I always feel bad. I hate it so much. And so it's, it's good to hear that this is not quite so tedious as compared to Rob's. Well, I enjoyed doing the actual braiding. Um, and the setup isn't that bad. It was just that it was taking a lot longer than I wanted. Um, sure. And I wasn't normally doing up to that point. I hadn't actually been streaming the setup portion because the room I'm doing it in is somewhat of a mess. But at least I've got a green screen that I can use to block off the worst of it. And I, I need to oh, I need to get a green screen for the same reason. But yeah, focused camera angles are my friend. But um, the. But yeah, don't feel bad because you're actually helping me quite a bit because my my great secret business plan is is that I want to do braids for other YouTubers that I like and respect um, and kind of get a cross pollination with their uh, audience and mm. kind of grow that way. And so I'm I'm looking at this all, you know, all of what I'm doing essentially is advertising for my hopefully eventual successful channel. Oh, I'm sure it will be. And that's awesome. Yeah, no, it's advertising for the channel is really everything. And, you know, I did. Well, let's see. When I started, I just started because I was running for office. And then. Um, yeah, I, I got you when you first like showed up on Nick's stream. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I've been watching Nick for like uh, since Rittenhouse. And uh, with the way my attention deficit works. I have to like listen to something while I'm at work because if it's boring work and I don't have something to listen to, I lose focus. Mm. So I've been listening, you know, I catch Nick's streams on the replay and through him, you know, I uh, started listening to Jeff and Rob and Ian. Actually, I ran across Ian uh, before I ran across Nick because um, he'd been invited on Viva Barnes. Um, so... I want to eventually do a braid for Barnes, but I don't think I can actually get much conversation with him for design work. So I got to spend time listening to try and figure out what it is that he would actually like. Because the way my brain works is if I'm doing this for somebody who will like the output, I can do it. No problem. But if they're just going to go, OK, that's nice, and then toss it into you know a drawer and never look at it again, uh, that I, I don't feel comfortable that's putting the effort That's incredibly demotivating. I couldn't do that. Yeah. So that's why I try and get a hold of people ahead of time, see if it's something they're interested in. If it is something, uh, figure out what it is they would like done um, mm -hmm. so that I can, uh, you know, get them something that they would like at the end. Right. So. Right. Yeah. I, I really, so I had been watching, my little brother was the one who had introduced me to Nick Ricada. And then I had watched him for a while and Originally, when I was campaigning, I thought, oh, well, that'd be fun to go on his show and kind of talk about the issues with DAs, right? And then, mm -hmm. obviously, he's impossible to reach. So I was like, okay, well, that's not going to work. And then I came across um, Legal Vice's channel, and I was like, oh, I like this guy. He's funny. Oh, my goodness. He's from Utah. Oh, my goodness. We have way more in common. I would love to be on his show. So I reached out to him, and I was like, hey, can I come on and talk about DAs? And he was like, yep. Absolutely. So he brought me on and it turns out he hated the DA I was running against. And yeah. he was like, hey, you know, you could have your own channel if you really worked at it. And I said, yeah, you know, I'll think about it. But then once the campaign was over and, you know, I had only won like 42 percent of the vote. I was like, OK, well, now what do I do? Right. And uh, I had decided, all right, I'm, I'm going to start streaming pretty regularly because I really enjoy it. 
And yeah, uh, there's not a lot of things that I enjoy enough to continue, you know, onward with. Usually I, I hate, oh, do I hate, you know, doing that kind of thing. So it's nice now to have some sense of like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is, you know, something I enjoy doing because I am one of those people where it's just, it's just tough. It's tough for me to pay attention. It's tough for me to be engaged for any, you know, long period of time, any period uh, of time. I don't know. Why I said long. <laughs> yeah, that's my camera boom. Oh, okay. Nice. So it's just a piece of scrap PVC that I, you know, put a angle piece on the end and drilled a hole through that I can put the set screw for the, uh, the camera. That's and, so genius. Uh, well, I figured I wanted to extend it out far enough that you can actually look down at what I'm doing. And I couldn't figure a way I could do it without spending a ton of money until it's like, wait a minute, all I need is a bar and I can, you know, drill holes through it. And that's all I need. So grab a scrap piece of work, drill a couple of holes, use a little bit of glue and it's good to go. Oh, that's so impressive. I, I worked at Raytheon and, you know, Raytheon has a lot... I think people would be shocked at how much our contractors utilize, you know, stuff that they create on their own that are made by hand, um, little tools, little, you know, pieces of hardware that go into much larger pieces. Um, it's really impressive. Yeah. And it was always fun to go up and see people doing the work that they did. So, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, um, He's got a job where uh, essentially he designs instrument packages for um, uh, helicopters so they can get, you know, flight data, uh, wind data and stuff like that for optimizing um, uh, helicopter designs and whatnot. So uh, he and I have wow. talked about the, the stuff they do in the machine shops there to be able to set things up. So, yeah, I can believe it easily. Yeah, I'm always impressed by their work. You know, I need to do some upgrades on some of my stuff because I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed by the lack of work I put into my channel. It's it's not that I have a lack of work. It's just it's finding the time to make changes and adjustments to my channel that's really hard. Like between yeah. my day job and trying to film and produce content and everything else, it's just tough. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a unfair advantage, so to speak, in that I do almost all live streaming. So I don't have to do a lot of editing because I'm not that great at video editing. Uh, I mean, back when I was doing IT stuff, I originally would do like website design in Notepad uh, back before they, you know, started coming out with WordPress and stuff that would design it for you or design the code for you from what you did. So that's impressive. Yeah, I, I've only done live streams now because it's just it's too much work it's just yeah. way too much work to keep up with everything i i try my best but you know i would like to make uh regular like uploaded video content but it's mm -hmm. the editing portion that just kills me and i don't know i like the interaction of having the chat i mean i can talk to myself for hours but there is something really nice about having the chat there and being able to interact with people who, you know, share things with me. And I feel, you know, they talk about that. What is that? Not really social, parasocial type relationship. Parasocial relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't feel that way. Like, I know that's strange to say, but really, if you think about it, aren't, isn't everybody sort of masking in public? Isn't everyone putting on a show for each yeah. other? I just don't see that much of a difference between what we already do in real life amongst each other and what we do online and how we communicate online. I guess, yeah. I, and maybe that's a, a, you know, a sign that I'm, I've been raised differently, right? I've been raised with the internet. And so maybe that's why I see things that way. But I just personally well, don't makes, have an issue. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, I've actually been online back when it was a matter of like, you know, dial up bulletin boards. Um, Jeez. since it is, since it is well past the statute of limitations, I used to actually connect up with, uh, other out of state bulletin boards, uh, war dialing, uh, long distance cards. So. Jeez. 
but I was like 12 at the time too. So you were 12 and we're already doing that. I love it. I respect the hustle. My dad was a um, uh, computer salesman back when it was like, um, I think when I was, oops, snagged the thread here on the corner of here. There we go. Yeah. Didn't want to cut the thread from the splinter. Um, my dad was like selling computers from when I was a little kid, back when it was like the Commodore pet. So mm -hmm. fact, I think when I was eight years old, I was uh, an extra on his uh, works um, uh, when they did a commercial for the local television. Com you know, there are pets and then there are pets. Uh, Commodore computers from the bite shop. Oh, but yeah, uh, our uh, our Maltese was also in the the, the commercial. I think it Your aired Maltese like maybe five. Star. <laughs> yeah, and she was the, an uh, action star. <laughs> yeah, uh, you are talking about elections. Um, where I am in Pennsylvania, uh, constable is an elected position. Really? Yep. Uh, well, it's congratulations. Done on, it's, yeah, it's done on a per ward basis. So about eight years ago when it was like the 2015 general election, went into the, uh, the polling booth and I was looking through and I noticed, hey, constable, nobody's running. And uh, so I got to thinking and it's like, you know what? I know what the minimums, you know, the minimum requirement for it is that you uh, be at the polls on election day to... Uh, you know, keep the peace and make sure that no qualified elector is uh, barred from reaching the polls. Um, so um, I, I went ahead and wrote my name in and I won with 100% of the vote, all one of it. Wow. So, <laughs> so nobody else ran? <laughs> nobody was running and nobody else wrote their name in. I love so, that so much. And so you just you just got it yourself a job. You just yep. applied. Um, to actually work for anything other than uh, at the polls, you have to be certified um, by the PCCD, which is the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And they're okay. the ones who also train um, the uh, sheriff, deputy sheriffs out here. Um, the municipal police are trained by... Um, Motec or something like that. Um, the uh, police have like about 850 hours of training. Um, the sheriffs have about the same thing, but they have an additional two weeks of um, uh, training on the stuff that like constables do as far as evictions and uh, 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 orders for possession. Um, sorry, orders of execution for like uh, sheriff sales and the like. What's what the requirements are for that? Um, constables do a lot of what the sheriffs do uh, for non law enforcement basis, as far as um, on the lower, uh, like small claims court level, uh, or as they call it here, the magisterial district courts. But all landlord tenant actions start in the magisterial district courts they sometimes get bumped up to the court of common pleas at which point the sheriff's department will deal with a lot of that mm. but uh yeah one of my primary things as a constable is uh, doing evictions which is not a fun part of the job but it's what i got elected for and i figure it's better to have somebody who's doing it who wants to do it properly and not just because it gives them you know a power rush or something like that so um, i figure if you know, good people aren't willing to do the job. You're left with the bad people willing to do the job. So it's true. So yeah. when you have an eviction order, like, do you, how often do you give people extra time to get their stuff? It's the way we do it is uh, we do the initial notice and then we have a minimum of 10 days um, with, you know, it's a little bit of extensions for uh, residential evictions. And I put on the notice, the time I've scheduled to do the eviction. And when we get there, I talk to the landlord and they usually give me an update. And if the landlord is willing to give them some extra time to like, you know, be able to make the payment or whatever, I'm more than willing to do it because I'm uh, acting to serve their order. It's, um, but I always try and do it in as non-confrontational a way as I can. You know, I try and give them a chance to like, you know, if you got any medicines or things you need, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead and grab them. I make sure that they're 
aware that even if they can't take everything with them, the way it works here, they have 10 days to make arrangements to pick it up. And the landlord has to hold on to it for at least 30 days if they do make arrangements to pick it up. So I try and do it to where it's the least impact on everybody that I can. That's but, kind yeah. of you. Yeah. Well, um, I, I've been told that I probably should be more aggressive in it, uh, but I got to deal with what I'm comfortable with on my conscience and my uh, obligations. So if I don't have to be a jerk, I try not to be a jerk. But if I do have to be a jerk, I can be. Um, sorry, just grabbing a drink there, throat's drying out. Um, but uh, yeah, I've I've probably um, uh, helped more people stay than uh, your average constable. But uh, Good. the the apparently uh, when the sheriff's department does an eviction out here, they basically just show up and say, "Get out." So. Unfortunately, that's very common, very, yeah. very common. And, uh, you know, I've had, I mean, I've been on the recipient side of that, right? As a kid, mm -hmm. uh, not as an adult. Thank goodness. I've, I've been frankly blessed uh, in the opportunities that I've been presented and kind of have made for myself. But I remember, I remember how much that sucked. And, you know, I just actually got in a fight with my landlord uh, last week. So... You know, I understand. I understand how frustrating it is. I think what pisses me off most about landlords I've dealt with is how disrespectful they are and how much they treat their tenants as though they're, you know, frankly, less than human. It's really unacceptable. Uh, it's just there's zero dignity, you know, afforded to those who rent. Yeah. And it'd be nice to, you know, own a home. At some point, I will. That's my anticipation. But not at interest rates the way that they are and not at the housing market the way it is. It's insane to me that houses right now are going for like $400,000, $500,000, half a million dollars for a home that should in all essence be valued at like two fifty. dollars Yeah. And yeah, it's I, like, I can't, I can't, I can't in good conscience, you know, shovel out cash for something that won't, maintain value. I mean, I understand, you know, the best time to buy was last month, right? That's what they yeah. always say. It's the last best time to buy was yesterday. But at the same time, it's like, okay, but then how, how though? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you have mommy and daddy helping you, it just seems nigh impossible. Well, we, uh, we uh, got the down payment for our house in like 2006 from the sale of the previous one that my wife had, uh, which they bought originally for about a hundred and it was only about two thirds of the way, uh, uh, to be, well, a little over half of the way being paid off. And, uh, we of course bought like six months before the market collapsed in 2006. Um, but, uh, I mean, we were upside down for a while, but, uh, like in the last five or 10 years, it's just been kind of ridiculous. It's like, uh, we've got like well over 150,000 equity right now. And, uh, it's at least, you know, if we need to, we've got that as a cushion, but yeah, I wouldn't want to try and start out now. And we were lucky that we started like, you know, 15, 18 years ago, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You really are. And it's, it's sad because there are so many people I'm sure who, you know, at the time that you bought, didn't buy cause they couldn't afford it. And now they're priced out of the market too, you know? So you really are very blessed. Um, well, it am wise, right? You could have chosen to do something else, but you chose the right, you made the right decision. So good for you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we did have to like refinance uh, at one point uh, because uh, we were having trouble with the uh, lender. Um, so we had kind of a bit of reset. We're not actually going to get paid off till like, you know, we're about 70. So but Jeez. that's one that's another reason I'm starting up the channel is so that you know I can get a little bit of side income as time goes on, maybe in retirement, um, doing something that I enjoy doing. So that's so cool. Yep. So where are we at now? What are we doing now? Still still setting uh, up? Yeah, give me a second after this one and I will uh, give you a count of where we are. Um, okay. but just be aware that like the uh, uh, put this in the wrong spot 
the uh, last um, setup for the braid, it was probably about 15, 18 hours to set up. So, and we're currently, for this setup, we are about hour, between hour three and hour four. So, uh, but I plan on streaming on um, Saturday, and I think I can probably get it completed set up by sometime Saturday. But, uh, eh, string, there we go, string caught on the threads here. Let me pull this back, just make sure the tension's good. Yep, that's good. All right, so just pass this on through. And uh, just trying to make sure that I have it pulled even, because if, if I let go and they get out of alignment, I have tensioning issues where like one thread's a lot longer than the rest of them and it doesn't like doing it that way. Um, so was there anything else that I was going to mention to you? Um, oh, yeah. After I'm done with this, I'll also bring up the uh, design for Jeff because I don't want to forget to show that to you. Oh, the other thing that I uh, enjoyed, uh, or I don't know, enjoyed is the proper word, but it was a thankful to Nick for is apparently, uh, while I haven't been officially tested for narcolepsy, uh, I have what they call idiopathic hypersomnia which is essentially narcolepsy without the test. So oh, okay. uh, I'm finally getting treated for that. So it's nice not being super sleepy all the time. No kidding. I bet. I, dude, I have ADHD and I take Ritalin, which is basically what they recommend usually for narcolepsy or something akin to it. And I just, yeah, I, I struggle as it is. So I, I can kind of relate. I, I wonder sometimes if I have narcolepsy. I've had instances, especially when I was um, when I was younger and super stressed out, whenever I would start a new job, once in a blue moon, not whenever, but every other job or so, I would get stressed out and pass out. Like I, I, I describe it as being suddenly asleep. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the type the if if I do have narcolepsy, it's not the cataplepsy or catalepsy or however you pronounce that type where you just suddenly fall out, you know, pass out. It's where you're just super tired and you fall asleep easy. Uh, I mean, they'd always joke at family gatherings that I'd sit down in a chair and I'd be asleep in like five minutes, unless I was like you know on a phone or uh, um, reading or something like that that would keep my brain active. Um, because, yeah, I'd come home from work, I'd sit in front of the computer and I'd read and not be productive because if I tried to get into like the uh, uh, creative side of my brain, I just kind of like doze off, which was frustrating. But for years, I was absolutely terrified of oversleeping and losing a job because that had happened to me a couple of times when I was younger um, and, you know, just not get to work. And it's like, OK, that's been three times. You're no longer working here. And that just really sucked. So. I had like an almost, you know, clinical fear of oversleeping. I had mm. like, I have, even now I have like four alarms in sequence to make sure I get up, uh, wake up enough that I can, you know, get up out of bed and get ready for work. All right. So let's see. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So we have 26 out of the 84 done. Jeez. And, How long uh, did it take you before to, to do 84? Uh, for Rob's braid, it took me, I think, looking back over it, somewhere in the ballpark of about 18 to 20 hours. Oh, so, my gosh. And his braid, all told, took about 80 hours, 85, something like that. Um, yours is probably going to take about half that long uh, for setup and for the actual braiding because you're about half the length of what he what I did for Rob. All right, so let me bring up uh, my DMs. Um, and, okay, legal vices, all right. And there we go. All right, so nothing's really showing there. All right, so share this tab instead. And, oops, helps if I uh, don't, unshare it instead of try and sharing it. Oh, that's so, very cool. 
That is very cool. So the main thing I'm wondering is if uh, for the chaos arrow, if he wants like the broken uh, head uh, design for the, uh, the the 45 degree angle ones, or if he wants it like on the top or the uh, uh, on the bottom one where it's connected, but it's a little off center because of how the, the braid works. But yeah, I figured, you know, a ship's wheel, a brandy snifter uh, cigar and the, uh, the chaos arrow for his, you know, he likes swords and role-playing games and stuff like that. Um, and fantasy that the, I, I got it from the, you know, the uh, Elric of Melna Bonet, uh, by Michael Moorcock saga. So that is so freaking cool. When, right. okay. So, all right. Can I brag about my braid for here for a second? Absolutely. <laughs> so the reason that I chose the braid design that I did is first of all, my mom, when she had her life after death experience, she was told to come back and tell the world that the key is love. So that's the little heart key. And then um, I fell in love with the angel Michael mm -hmm. when I was running for office. And I didn't realize that he was the patron saint of the police or anything like that. And I've kind of always seen myself as kind of this like, I don't know, I don't want to say God warrior, <laughs> but like. I'm not a bad person, right? Like I try to be a good Christian and mm. the snowflakes are because not only do I live here in Utah, but I, I sent you some of the Ruthenian designs that are from my ancestors. And yeah. uh, this kind of mimics it really well, which I love. And then the sword in the heart. I mean, come on. That is so cool because I had the sword and shield design for my that's, campaign. That's exactly where I lifted that from. Uh the uh, um, I, I was looking for stuff, so I brought up your uh, campaign page, and it's like, oh, that would actually translate over really well. Let's go ahead and add that in. Oh, I love it so much. And then, you know, the reason I picked the colors that I did is because I actually want to wear this and the design that I chose. You know, I want to be able to wear it with dresses and, you know, fun outfits. So I'm really, really excited to see the final product. Yep. Um, I do still need a final link for you. I'm doing it to where I've got enough thread that I can go up to 36 inches, which I figure is a, a comfortable margin. And we'll just do it to the length you want. If you will hold on just two seconds, I will find something to measure myself with. Just no put problem. me on hold for two seconds and I'll give you my measurements. Hold on. Okay. All right. So to the chat, I'm sorry I haven't been keeping up with the reading. Uh, but since Danny's been on, I've been talking to her and I'm trying to get through this as fast as I can because I'd like to be back to braiding as soon as possible. And I am really, really happy with how well this um, uh, warping frame is working. Once uh, it stops, you know, wrapping around the base of the cones, which it only did for like the first two on white, it's been really easy to do. I'm not having any resistance walking away from it. And the design changes I'm thinking of doing um, will make it a lot. Uh, I mean, I'll be able to do multiple colors instead of just the two. So I can do other braids because I'm really, really enjoying working with silk. Not so much just because of the fancy factor, but it handles really nicely when you're braiding. It's softer on the hands and uh, just makes me happy to, to work in that medium. So... All right, so walking back to the halfway point here. Yeah, All right, so point. the top of my hips, I'm at 32 inches on top. Okay. So if it's 32 on my hips, I think I think 38 is more than enough. I think that'll be perfect. Okay, so you want 38? Would that make sense? 32? Yeah, we can, we can do 38, no problem. Yeah, because that way it, it kind of... With that loop, that way it doesn't come undone and there's more, there's a little more length, you know, in case I get girthier, that could always happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if it's any consolation, um, since my guess is that uh, we're from relatively uh, similar genetic her heritage, since uh, I also grew up in a Mormon family and uh, my mom was like five, uh, 100, 10, 120 pounds, pretty much for all her life, even currently when she's not able to 
walk as much these days. Uh, my uh, encouragement is that you're likely to be able to keep your uh, current weight over time if uh, that plays out. You know, if I'm lucky, and, I, and I'm a pretty lucky girl in other ways, so my hope is is that I'll be lucky that way as well. But you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep my my hopes up too high. Okay. <laughs> Plus, my waist is my waist is significantly smaller than my hip ratio, mm -hmm. so the waist to hip ratio is not bad. But okay. like, you know, when you're bloated and feeling uncomfortable, and you know, you want to wear something cute. You need a little slack, so. Yeah. But once um, I have babies, that's not going to be the case. I'd imagine once I have kiddos, that everything is off the table. I don't care how how big I get. Don't care how small. I just care about having a healthy, happy baby. Yep. Um, speaking of my mother and whatnot, and I'm sure uh, this will uh, hopefully be uh, something that you'll enjoy listening to. Um, since you've been having to go over some of the uh, less pleasant sides of the uh, uh, church's interactions with people. Um, yes. My, my mother is one of those people that she just wants to be a good person. I had a at home, wonderful childhood. I had issues outside of home, but at home, it was always a, a good place you could go back to. And um, my wife likes to joke that my mom has, you could say she's weaponized niceness, except that she would never do it to make anybody feel guilty. But telling her no is like kicking puppies. Not because, you know, she she tries to guilt people. It's just you you feel that bad if you disappoint her. So, but uh, my, my wife also says that's how I uh, learned my uh, uh, resistance to... Uh, uh, persuade, you know, people trying to argue me into positions that I don't uh, want to be. I just, it's kind of like a brick wall. I'm not rude or anything like that. It's just like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. I'm not changing my mind. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's wise. And I, I think that's strong of you. And, you know, I wonder if that's necessarily a Mormon thing or just a good mom thing. Right. I don't know. I, I do see it here a lot. And someone in the chat, let me know. Is that a normal mom thing or is this a more of a common thing amongst the LDS folk? Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's been hard to talk about, you know, my Mormon background and my culture and my, my upbringing, because, you know, there's so many people who are members of the church who aren't raised in Utah, who don't, who haven't really interacted with the church out here, which yeah. let's be real. It, as much as the church tries to conform, you know, other churches outside, you know, to kind of mirror what's done in Utah. Um, there is a huge difference between what you experience in the state and what you experience in the mission field, right? Yeah. So it's tough because when I say things, people think, oh, that's how all Mormons must be. And I try my best to clarify, no, this is, this is my culture, my upbringing, but that's not necessarily the doctrine, nor is it the culture of everyone else who's been raised in the church. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just tough because people want to jump to conclusions and they want to be like, Oh, you must hate the LDS church, you know, or, you know, what there's just all kinds of things, but I was raised with it. So it doesn't bother me so much. I think if it bothered me more, um, I wouldn't say anything, but I think cause I was raised outside of the state of Utah being LDS. And I had so many people who would make assumptions, right. Who were like, Oh, are you the third wife, you know, or whatever else yeah. that it, it just stopped bothering me early on. Um, now though, it's, it's sad when people don't watch my whole video and I make a criticism of the culture or of a belief that I just feel is not healthy for people um, or can be utilized and weaponized against people that they automatically assume that I hate my former religion or that I hate the people I associate with. And that's simply untrue. Yeah. So well, that, that can be very challenging. Well, while I still am, I'm not a great one. Um, I mean, I haven't been to church in quite a while, but um, my wife actually converted, I think primarily because of 
the type of person I was and the type of person my mom was. And even if she, you know, wasn't like, uh, uh, into it for the doctrine, it was, uh, worse, you know, her, her view was like worst case, if it raises people like this, it's something I would rather be a part of than not. So, it's true. It's true. I mean, the whole idea of church in my mind, religion and church in general, is it's mm -hmm. sort of like a spiritual gym, right? Like you, you don't go in there because you're perfect and you're a muscle man already and you're, you know, you're built. There are people who go in there and they've been in it for a long time and it's made them really great people. And, you know, they go to church for maintenance every week and they want to share what they've learned and the techniques that they've learned to make themselves better people with others. And I think that's really a beautiful thing. But I think it's really important to understand that, you know, you don't just because you go to church, it doesn't mean that you're in shape, right? Spiritually yeah. speaking. And just because, and just because you're at church with everyone else, it's not a competition. <laughs> like, yeah. I think people get so competitive in their righteousness, like, oh, I'm going to be better than that other person. And it's just not, it's not necessary. Well, and I just, I, I personally don't think that God thinks that way. I think that's very much a human way of seeing things. My philosophy is that I want to be the type of person I can respect. Uh, back when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I was hanging out with a, uh, um, I don't know the best way to put them, but I'd say probably a fabulous type crowd. Um, and it just, it, I got to the point where I realized I don't actually respect these people. And mm. uh, some of it was, you know, what they uh, believed or whatnot, but uh, the main part was how they interacted with other people and the respect they had for other people. So um, it was like, you know what? Um, I'm not going to be the type of person I can respect if I hang around with people that I don't respect. And right. uh, so that that's the point I kind of tried to get my life to where um, I hung around with people that, you know, were uh, honest, ethical, and I could respect, uh, respect them for who they were and how they would deal with life and tried to kind of model myself on that behavior. So that's awesome. But That's yeah, really, I, I, really awesome. It's important. It's important. You know, we tell it to kids all the time. Surround yourself with good friends. It's just mm -hmm. as important as adults because people, man, I, I've been fortunate. I don't have it quite as much happen to me. Um, but that's not true. There's a lot of people though, who once you're friends with them, they're just there to use you and they're just there to kind of float with you. And they're not people who inspire you to be a better person. And yep. so I agree with you. I think, I think that's admirable to be a person who you would respect. Yeah. Um, I don't thing, know if I can make that my goal just yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think just no being worries. a decent person is, is good for now. I'm like, uh, you know what? C's get degrees, baby. <laughs> I'll take whatever I can get. Thanks heaven. Yep. Uh, I'm definitely, uh, you know, I'm, I don't always live up to what I think I should, but it, it's a goal that you should always, that I always try and strive for as opposed to, okay, I'm there. It's, uh, you, you know, you're only as good as the last thing you do. Oh, don't but, say uh, that. I hope that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Um, but I meant it as, you know, uh, you know, if you've been a good person yeah. and then you're not a good person for a while, uh, eventually you're just, you're not a good person. you got to keep working at it. So. Yeah. Right. Um, That's true. Yep. Um, trying to think for a second here about. Um, we can definitely always do better. Yeah. I just, I wish that in the culture I grew up in that making mistakes was seen as a positive you know oh, yeah. like you know because i feel like the way i was raised it was always seen as if you make a mistake it's because you you intentionally did it or you know you failed to intentionally do the right thing right rather yeah. than seeing it as hey you know what we're human beings it's okay to make a mistake we'll figure it out you know yeah. there's um there was a really neat post I saw. Somebody posted it on Twitter. 
or X. I don't remember where it was, but I saw it this morning and it was like, this guy who's who was out with his son. I don't know if it's true. There's no verifiability of this, right? But yeah. there was this great um, instance where um, can we can we not make that noise, please? Thank you. Um, where this guy was out with his son and he had filled up the slushy, and the son accidentally spilt the slushy on the ground, right? And it just went everywhere, all over the gas station. There was just red and blue mixed yuck everywhere. And the father, instead of getting upset, which is, you know, the reaction I was raised with, instead turned to the son and said, oh, looks like you dropped your slushy. Let's clean it up. We all make mistakes sometimes. It looks like, uh, you know, we dropped it. Well, let's clean it up real quick. So dad and son get together and they clean it up. And he says, you know, the importance of cleaning it up quickly is uh, so that no one else gets, you know, harmed by the mistakes that we make. And yep. so it's important to take accountability for when we when we make a mistake and then, you know, maybe next time if you're <laughs> maybe next time you'll you'll be a little more focused in what you're doing at the time. So that way you don't make the same mistake again. And yeah. that was it. And I'm like, that is the sweetest way to teach a child. And honestly, a very, in my mind, efficient way to teach a child that lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Um as far as, you know, you know, mistakes being learning experiences, I had a pretty horrible mistake when I was younger. And for a long time, I was thinking, you know, I would love to be able to go back and like not make that mistake. And while I'm still, you know, would, uh, you know, it was not something that I would voluntarily do. I'm not sure if I was given the opportunity to go back in time and uh, reverse it if I would, just because I would not be the person I am today. And I'm much happier with the person I am now than I would be if I hadn't had that experience and had had to, you know, grow up from that hard experience. So, yeah, exactly. You know, people I when I was younger, I tried to live without regrets. Right. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want to live a life full of regret. That was that was my biggest fear. And now I'm getting to the point where it's like, you know what? I don't regret. Oh, baby. Stop. Yeah, we're not. He's he's all upset. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. <laughs> Mom. So um, now I'm though to the point where I'm like, yeah, you know what? All of my mistakes or the things that I would normally regret have made me into the person I am today. So I I have no business regretting it. You know, I my only objective now is to appreciate every experience that I've had, whether it's positive or negative to learn from it and to just try, you know, to do better the next time that opportunity presents itself. Well, we've jumped from uh, 26 to 30. Woohoo! Woo -hoo, we are moving. We're yep. flying. Ouch. So you went from 18 hours. We're almost at, we're at 30 now. Um, well, let me look this. Uh, okay. So we're about an hour and a half in. So we're about three and a half hours into the setup on this braid. Wow. You can see why I'm much, much happier with my current braiding frame. I'm not braiding, the warping frame. I am much, much happier for you, man. That's awesome. Yep. And, uh, oh, uh, got something I want to show as an example of what I want to do as the improvement so I can do more than two colors. Yeah, that, yeah. A braid that I really like doing is called the Kiko which is like a tortoiseshell pattern. Oh my gosh, that is so, takes, so pretty. So it takes three colors. And if I use 12 cones per color, I need to have like 36 on the stand. I might have to get like a different stand or get like two of them. But the design thing I'm thinking of um, that would make it where I could do more than two colors on the, the warping stand would let me do braids like this in silk. That that's amazing. I would love that as like a tie. I know that that sounds weird because it seems a little thick, but I think that'd be a really cool tie. Yeah. Well, Moon, um, yeah. the tortoise shell is, yeah. as I understand it culturally, is you know like a, a symbol of long life. So they would uh, make it into uh, sego, which is the uh, the the cord that they wrap around the katanas and whatnot. Um, 
So it's a it's a popular pattern for that. That is so cool. It's much smaller and thinner. Okay. So I did two blues and I had to do a white to make a difference. So I need another white. Okay. Just trying not to get lost in my uh, order here. But uh, yeah, this is definitely working out a heck of a lot better. And uh, I do apologize to the chat that I'm not uh, responding directly, but uh, I figure since I have a chance to talk to you, while I'm talking to you, I can actually keep working this really fast. So I figured I'll take really? advantage of that. I'm going to mute my mic because my dog has decided to impromptu argue with me. And so, listen, no, I know you're frustrated, but the answer is no. No, you need to stop. I understand. Yes, I can... I, I, I'm sure you're extremely bored and frustrated, but you got to just hang out, buddy. He's got a nice vocal range there. <laughs> he does. He's, um, he's very verbal. He just, he wants to tell me all about it. He's frustrated. He's like, mom, I got this cone on my head. I'm sitting here. It's driving me nuts. But no, everybody in the chat is saying, hey, man, I'm just loving your braid. Um, do you want me to read the super chats to you while you work? Well, I would uh, like that, except for the fact that I have yet to be able to unlock Super Chats. Oh, not Super Chats. Excuse me, your chat. Oh, yeah. No worries. Uh, yeah, if uh, anybody says anything that needs to be passed on, if you want to pass it on, I would definitely appreciate that. Sure. So David Nielsen says, humans are imperfect. Be the best you can. But no, you'll make mistakes. Uh, Lady Dracona says, hey, Torin and Danny in chat. Philip Martin says a response my dad has used to uh, has used to I didn't mean to is but you didn't mean not to. Ooh, I don't know if I like that one. That seems rather aggressive. Uh, I was about to say that's pretty passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, geez, that sounds like something an attorney would write. Um, Un, I said no. I said no. I understand. Yes. But yeah, one of the uh, uh, the things I mentioned to people as far as, you know, when they talk about how government should do this or that, the problem with government is it's made up of people. And they're just as fallible as everybody else. So. Yeah, and people seem to be a little more fallible, especially when they're all grouped together. Yep. There's something, Very, there's something about a, a collective IQ that we struggle with. Our fungi family doesn't seem to struggle quite as much, but we definitely do. Yeah. Like um, everyone in chat, Un is doing but, great after his surgery, if you can't already tell. He's he's very rambunctious. As a matter of fact, that's part of the problem is he's supposed to be on bed rest and kind of like not going crazy. But he's he's got attitude and he wants the whole world to know it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I lost the thought I was going to say there. Um, oh, I'm sorry you ruined it. Oh, oh, no worries. Um, I'll eventually remember it. Uh, it wasn't like, oh, I have to say this. It was just like, oh, I was going to mention something along those lines. But um, uh, something about government and people and oh yes, um, I remember it now. The it reminded me of the line from uh, Men in Black: "A person is smart. People are stupid and panicky." <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, a lot of times. Oh, someone in chat says, um, at Lady Dracona says, making my first attempt and uh making my first attempt an Afghan on 55 in infantry in infinity loom. Sorry, okay. I can't read. Pray for nope. sanity, please. LOL. I am praying for your sanity, Lady Draconis. Good luck with that. Yep. Oh, um, speaking of looms and the like, um, when I was doing my 12 hour marathon stream, um, had a lady come in and wanted to know if I knew anything about looms. Um, and, uh, I wasn't sure she said, she said it was an electronic loom and hmm. I said, I'm not familiar with it, but if you've got like a picture or like a, uh, since it was electronic, some sort of model number or something on it, um, I'd be happy to try and help. 
turns out what she had was like a 1980s vintage electro uh, electro knitting machine uh, put out by Brother, the same company that does uh, printers and like uh, CNC machines. Um, and I was able to find her a manual for that. Uh, so hopefully she was able to get where she needed to be with it. But uh, at least she would know what it was and what it was worth. But it was controlled by Mylar punch cards. Huh. So. Interesting. So kind of like um, one of those old tiny pianos that had the music sheets with the holes in it. Um, I don't think it was like a continuous sheet, but... Um, uh, it was definitely uh, along the lines of, um, well, CNC stands for computer numeric control. And before that, it was just numeric control where they control the machines with programmable punch cards. So, mm -hmm. yeah, probably right along those lines. I just thought it was interesting that they were using Mylar for this, the control cards. So That is, that's really cool. I love that because I, I always thought like Mylar was really delicate no um depends on how thick you make it um it can be a thin film you can uh, uh you can make it a lot thicker um since i started working at a plastic shop i've learned a whole lot more about plastics than i used to know hey i am so sorry to call this short but i have oh. never seen him with this much attitude in my his entire life so i i think i owe it to him to take him out He's been very patient for the last hour and 40 minutes. I am mm -hmm. stuck. I am stuck. So I will call it an evening. I will okay. be back. Thank you so, so much for having me on and for designing this braid. I'm so excited to see as it progresses. Now, what is your streaming schedule? I usually do Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. Uh, your time zone usually about 530 to 730. Though tonight, uh, since I don't have to be up tomorrow because uh, I don't have an overtime shift, um, I'm probably going to run maybe three or four hours tonight. And I try and have at least one weekend stream. This weekend, it's probably going to be Saturday. Sunday, I've got Con Ed for Constables. It's uh, prisoner transport. But my county doesn't let us transport prisoners because about 30 years ago, some constables ticked off the sheriff's department. So... But the counties all around me uh, use constables for almost all their prisoner transport and apparently save a lot of money at it because our fee bill was last updated in like the 80s. So, oh, yeah. Courtroom security pays $13 an hour. That's oh. less than what they're paying at some fast food restaurants right now. So, yeah. So, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. You're welcome back anytime. It just if you want to be on, feel free to like send me a, a DM and I'll be happy to send you a link. I definitely will. Thank you so much for having me on. Sorry for talking so much. And I really apologize for my disruptive puppers. And uh, I can assure you it won't happen next time. It's just because Mr. On is out of town. So thank you yeah, so no very worries. much. And you guys all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, I am going to quickly look through and see if there's anything I need to catch up in the chat before I move back on to this. But we are at three, six, eight, three, six, eight. Okay, we are at 32 right now. So we're almost at the halfway point. All right, let me scroll back a little bit. Um, okay, the uh, infinity loop. Uh, if I'm reading that right, unbronzed Aussie Laura. Um, welcome to the stream. I think this is the first time I've seen you on a live one. Okay. Gold Coast of Australia. So it's... Uh, all right. So if I remember right, let's see, nine. So it's about lunchtime where you are, if I've got the time frame right. Um because I know Korea is 13 hours ahead and Aussie Overlord's part of Australia is 14 hours ahead. So I'm going from that. So uh, that would be like 11.15 or 12.15 your time zone. But welcome to the stream. It's good to have you on. All right. Uh, all right. I think I've scrolled back uh, far enough for anything that needed an immediate response. 
Yep. Uh, if I remember right, I think we talked about this on Discord. Uh, I I got really lucky in that. Of course, then again, I waited until it was like 54 to get um, checked out for it. Okay, let's see. I think I caught up with everything there. All right, so we are back to current. 11.15. Okay, I was actually got it right the first time. Woohoo! All right, let me grab a quick swig. And we are ready for blue next. So we are roughly, actually, we are over just a little over a third of the way set up. And we are roughly four hours in. So that theoretically implies that it'll be about 12 hours total. I was hoping to have it under 10, but still, I'm running close to twice as fast. And do want to give a, a shout out and thanks to everybody who's here in the chat. Uh, you're really helping the channel grow. Uh, you guys are watching it. Uh, I did mention at the start of the stream, since I'm not actually going to use numbers because I don't want to trigger any of uh, YouTube's. Uh, we don't want to monetize you because you're uh, artificially upping your engagement. So I'm not going to mention the uh, watch hours necessary. But at the current rate, we're about six to seven weeks out from monetization. So I'm hoping that will happen sooner than I'm predicting because we've gotten so many new members in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been kind of funny watching uh, YouTube decide that they don't want me to uh, grow that much um, because a couple of days ago we hit 1180 and then it dropped to 1179. Then it went back up to 1180. Then it dropped back to 11.79. Then it went up to 11.80. Then back to 11.79. So it goes up and down like one person two or three times a day since then. But, all right, just get this one tied off here. And uh, I do have to say that uh, since more people have been showing up in the chat, it's gone from being like an hour or two as a long stream to like, wow. Where'd the time go? So you guys make this a lot nicer for me as well. So I appreciate that. And it's very nice that Danny came on. It's nice to be able to talk to her. Fortunately, I'm such a small channel that I'm pretty sure that this is none of this is getting clipped. <laughs> Not that I'm worried about that. Okay, going to have to cut some more um, bits of tape for my midway markers pretty soon because I just used the last one I pre-cut. So after this one, I will go ahead and do that. Another nice thing is we're still doing better than we were for um, Static on the uh, threads where it made it where they didn't want to clump together. All right, so apparently it's easier if I just turn this over and then drop it through than it is trying to feed it up from the bottom. And make sure I got all of them. Grab and let it flip back. There we go. thread here. So I did pick the length for this for 36 inches and apparently I need to go for 38. I do tend to be a little generous when I'm lining things up so I probably have enough for that. Actually probably about a foot more than I need uh, for 36 inches. And I can, with the leaders on, I can braid almost all the way to the end. So that should, I should have enough that it's not going to be an issue. There we go. And move this back. And there we go. 
the lower exit knot here. As you guys probably noticed, I've started to tear off the uh, excess um, painter's tape flags because the uh, I've got enough of the weave on it now that it's uh, not moving around as easily. So I don't have to worry about uh, worry about slipping around as much. Well, th uh, thank you, unbr unbronzed uh, Aussie Laura. Uh, making sure I'm reading that right. Um, Jeff's a great person. He's been really uh, helpful behind the scenes. So appreciate that he's sending people my way. Yeah, there we go. That's the right way to do that. All right. So it's under the first one. Over the second one. Under the third one. Over the fourth one. Under, over, under, and over and under. All right. Bring this one back up to where it's supposed to be. A little bit higher up. And all right, so we've got three there, right, so that one can go. I think i got some extras on the top that can go as well. One, two, and three. Nope, just one. All right. I figure three is a good number. After that, they're holding enough. That they're not likely to slide as easily. And in case it, let's see, there we go. Sorry about that. In case it's not clear, this and this are the same one, so I'm adding them on. And so on this side, I'm move on this side. I'm moving forward. On this side, I'm moving back. Eventually, it's gonna even up. So let me move these to where they're on even pins, or where there's no gaps between the pins. Is what I'm trying to say. All right. So. Um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so the top is off by one. Let's go ahead and line that up. side two yeah I think uh, once I get the uh, CAD work designed for what I was thinking for the addition for the braiding frame uh, not braiding frame the warping frame I know I tend to use frame a lot I apologize if it's getting a bit redundant for the different things uh, but to me, a takadai is a braiding frame as opposed to a loom, because a loom, to me, is something that you weave on. And while this is similar, it's not exactly weave. It's not precisely weaving. So, all right, let me just did a blue one. We're ready for white next. Let's go ahead and uh, preposition some tama or stage some tama. I'm actually about halfway through what I've uh, staged on the or 
put on the top of the stairwell to have ready to go. And I still have a box of 20 that I haven't put up there, but there's enough room for them now. But I'll probably wait till I'm closer because unfortunately, while they're up on the edge of the uh, the rail on the edge of the stairs, it's easy to knock them off and have them fall all the way down the stairs, and that makes a lot of noise. And I try not to be uh, that rude to my wife and our roommate, I'm making a lot of noise. And that one stuck enough that it pulled out. All right. Let me wrap around a little bit so that doesn't happen again. And okay, it looks like what happened there is I'm a little tangled around the. Uh, Go. All right. Let's see. They're all feeding through now. All right. So where's the stuck one? There it is. Move this up so it's not. Ah, that's what happened. One of the uh, other ones kind of wrapped around it and dropped down. So it was binding. All right. So. Let's go ahead and, yep, now they're all coming freely. This is a lot nicer once it, when it's operating properly. Everything feeds easily. And the uh, improvements I'm thinking of should make that a permanent thing. Basically, I'm going to machine a plate out of plastic that will go on the mid-level stage. And so instead of using binder clips, it'll be... Uh, quarter inch thick plastic that extends out on either side that has a bunch of holes drilled in it. I can feed them through the individual holes. That way they don't get that close to each other until they get to the one on the top. And I'll do like another smaller sheet with just four larger holes where I can, uh, you know, gather them up for four different colors. Huh. That last one looks like I had one wrapped around the wrong side. Let's tie it once more just to make sure that it stays nice and even. There we go. Now it doesn't look weird. Let's roll this up for staging. And I realized I forgot to cut more tape, so I'll have to do that real quick. A little pair of cheap scissors here. that. They used to be hair cutting scissors, but they can kind of beat up since then. All right. So got the long strips. Let's cut them up into little squares. And make sure I pick them off the scissors rather than letting them fall on the floor. Not that they have, because when I cut it, the adhesive kind of sticks to the edge of the blade a little bit and keeps it from dropping until I can grab a hold of it, which works out well. I'll have to try and hold on to both sides of it while I'm doing the cut, which would be really awkward. I'd need like an extra hand for that. And while I like reading Lovecraftian type stories, I don't want to be an eldritch horror with multiple tentacles. Tentacles? Oh, speaking of uh, tentacles, um, there is a rather cute musical that's done to the music in Fiddler on the Roof called Shondath on the Roof. Um, at least I think that's what it is. Um, uh, and it's got a bunch of cute Lovecraftian songs done to that music. Uh, instead of tradition, it's tentacles. Almost there. Two more pieces to cut. One more, and I'll be ready to start rolling things up again. That one almost got too adhesive to the blade. All right. 
we are pre-staged with the uh, tape. Go ahead and walk this back. It's another nice thing is that when I've been walking it back, I haven't really had to work on making sure that it wasn't twisted and tangled up. They were all pretty well parallel, not wrapping around each other. Apparently one of the tricks to getting this uh, warping frame to work properly is you can't let the threads go back too far or they drop around the bases of the cone. And that makes it inconvenient when they want to bind up that way. All right. So I have talked about uh, wanting to do, or going to be doing a braid for legal vices and Wanting to do one for Robert Barnes. I uh, also, also want to do one for Neurotic Gary. And um, thinking, you know, at least in the constellation of uh, other people that I'm doing braids for is possibly uh, Uncivil Law Kurt, um, uh, Joe Good Logic, um, Steve Gosney. So I have a definite list of people I can go through. It's just a question of what order I want to do them in. Um, reason I'm wanting to do one for Larry Korea, possibly before legal vices, if I can get a response back that it's something he would enjoy. Uh, I'm pretty sure he would, but I got to kind of do something that he would like done as opposed to just going with my gut type thing. Um, is there's a convention I'm going to in Virginia in January called MarsCon. I'm just going as a participant, not as a, a vendor or anything like that. Um, it's a literary convention, so like science fiction, fantasy books, comic books, things like that. Um, I think they have some gaming too, but I'm not, I have to go through uh, their stuff a bit more to find out if that's the case or not. But my wife and I are going to that. I figured it'd be a nice weekend away for her in a hotel room. Um, she's probably not going to actually go to the convention per se, but a chance to spend some time with me and, you know, relax in a hotel and not have to worry about household stuff. Yeah. There we go. So, yep, that's the way that should be. Okay, so that's going on the underside and over, under, over, under, over, under. Over and under. All right. Let's bring the flag back up to where it's supposed to be. Have to unroll this end a bit more. I have yet to get a. Uh, uh, let me bring that up so people know what I'm talking about. All right. I have to um, uh, talk to Jeff to see how long he wants it. He said he was going to do it as a display piece, like up on the wall. So he may only want like maybe 12 or 24 inches, but I'll have to see uh, specifically what he would like. He's also getting a hundred Tama one because I need the more pixels to get the designs to look better. Yep. It should definitely be fun for both of us. I'm Presuming that's about going to the convention and spending time in a hotel together. I got stuff to do in, during the day. We can eat dinner together and have a nice evening together. Uh, it's just a weekend convention, so not a horrible amount of time um, to travel. Uh, it's probably about a five-hour drive from where we live. Excuse me. And I should have that Friday off from work. And my wife works Friday evenings, but she can, she's got more 
uh, paid time off than I do, so she shouldn't have any issue with that. Should be some nice, nice time together. Okay, and uh, unbronzed Aussie uh, or Laura, thank you again for coming on the stream. Appreciate that. Um, thank you very much for the positive energy, and uh, you have a good day. All right, so blue is next. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and pause for a minute here. Uh, my wife is going to head to work in a little bit, and I want to run down and wish her a good, safe evening uh, before she heads out. So I am going to hop on over to the hold music here, and let's not do it too loud to begin with, and go ahead and put on hold music. I'll be right back up. And I am back to save you from the hold music. There we go. Moving back to chat. Okay, so blue is the next color. Oops, lost several people with that. I apologize. All right, now I'm going to... The uh, uh, spot here where I have the... Uh, one I tie off to before I pull it over has been uh, having issues with the tape not behaving, so I just did a quick edit to that. And there we go. And that is pre staged. Thing is hooked up. Okay. The blue has definitely been behaving itself tonight for warping up. And while this is definitely more expensive than the way I was doing it, I think the time savings over multiple braids will more than make it worth it. And Eventually, I'm going to be 
uh, spending roughly the same amount anyway. This is just kind of front loaded. And there we go. Let's prep this one, get it in position. All right, we are ready for walk back. And at the halfway point here, let's go ahead and tape this one off at the midway point and continue on back. Is on. And snip has been done. I think I, last time I didn't uh, move the camera over. Sorry about that. Oops. I need to uh, pass it through the D ring first. There we go. And. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, getting the muscle memory back for this, which will also help. And there we go, all through. And first one. One did not go through comfortably. So let's try this again. Two. One more, and we are there. Looks like I'm getting a little bit of static, but not too bad. There we go. Let's move that back and roll up this Tama. And Mark said not it. There we go. Well, the tape's doing its job. It's actually holding the other Tom at 100 grams from falling down. Okay. Don't want to wind it up too far. It makes, well, I have to unroll it again if I do that. Okay. So. Okay, so that's what I was doing. I was taking the side with the flag, hanging it over, then I would just drop this down the back and bring it back from underside. And yes, that looks correct. So I'm under the first, over the second, under the third, Over the fourth, over the fifth, over the sixth, over the seventh, over the eighth, under the ninth, and over the tenth. Let's see, that does look like a nice even weave. Bring this up to the rest of them are, and take off the oldest flag. There we go. Let's see. How many do I have so far? So four, eight, nine, and four. 8, 10, so I got 36, or no, uh, 38, um, okay, so 38, 40, oh, see, so I'm only uh, two colors away from reaching the halfway point at four hours, a little over four hours, okay, so yeah, I should definitely be able to get this done in under 10.
I'm feeling better about that. All right, so we just did a blue. We are ready for white next. Let's pre-stage some armor. Go. And yeah, I'm doing white. Okay. All right, let's detach that. And it feels like I did not let it fall back. Something's there we go. Whatever was binding was only doing it for a first little bit. It's drawing out nice. The drag just comes freely. Or as they say, the import document comes now. At least in some areas. Eventually to be a fine Victorian porn novel by Ian Runkle. At least I think that's what he was threatening to do. Okay, and first knot is tied nicely. A little shorter on one end than I'm used to, but obviously not the other end because that goes all the way back to the uh, warping frame. And two looks good. One more to go. Finish getting this in position for the walk back. There we go. And back to the midway point. Let's go ahead and take the midway point. There we go. much to fall back down. Don't have the scissors stick to the magnet. No, it's a long-term problem. That's one of the things I've been thinking about getting. Um, had at the old job, don't really have it at the new job because we don't deal with the same as many of the same types of tools. But we had a uh, demagnetizer at the old shop. Um, basically what it is, is it's a uh, spinning electromagnet that uh, spins very fast to kind of randomize the magnetic field in something. Um, so basically if you put um, ferrous material in a stable magnetic field, that kind of impresses the magnetic field on uh, the ferrous material. Um, you could actually like magnetize uh, worn out magnets or whatever with a uh, device that creates a giant electromagnetic field temporarily. But yeah, if you move something through a spinning magnetic field, it's pretty good at randomizing uh, it so that the piece that gets passed through is no longer magnetic because all the little fields don't line up in one direction and you know, and they don't fight against each other uh, or so the lineups, they do fight against each other, and you don't have uh, a strong pull in any direction. There we go. Whoops, I forgot to move the, the camera over. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of awed by how fast this is going compared to the last time. And, okay. Still works at not on this side. Check out the chat here. Hey, Lady Draconis, I probably missed you heading out, but you have a good day. So if you catch this on replay chat, thank you very much. Uh, 
Come on. Try to do the Lark's head knot, and I keep, because the other end is hanging free, it keeps wanting to pull out of my grasp. There we go. All right. Probably too short, though. Let's go ahead and see if my procedure works. Yep, it does. Okay, so we are under the first, over the second, under the third, over the fourth, under the fifth, over the sixth, under the seventh, over the eighth, under the ninth, and over the tenth. And let's unroll this long enough that it'll actually fit in the proper spot. Since we got just about half on this, let's go ahead and get this a little more over on the left-hand side. All right, and let's unroll the... Probably should have unrolled the right side more before I did the left. Okay. And it's sitting a bit low, but not too bad. All right, let's pull the oldest flag off. There we go. Okay, we're ready for the next. Let's move this up a little bit. And There we go. One's pretty staged there. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is getting a little crackly. Grab the swig real quick. So we're doing blue next. Good night, Rachel. Um, uh, Duick or D I don't think it's straight pronounced duck, but uh, glad to have you on the stream. Hope you have a good night. Okay, voice is doing a little bit better now. a thread. No, I think I got everything. It just must have snagged around. Let me double check. Let's see if any have fallen. Nope, there is none on the floor, so I didn't, I didn't lose one. That's a good thing. Just felt like I did. Oh, I've been uh, occasionally listening to a uh, Creepy Pasta channel, uh, as I think they're called, uh, called Dark Somnium. Pretty decent sized channel. Uh, I think they're over a million subs or more. I have to double check. I uh, could be thinking of a different channel. Uh, today's offering uh, was rather uh, Lovecraftian in nature. Uh, also dealt with mental illness. It was a pretty decent read. It's like what do you do when your world is invaded by Lovecraftian horrors um, that don't really look out of the ordinary and you have problems with uh, distinguishing reality from hallucination? What can you do then? Okay. And there we go. Oops. I am snagged on my phone case. Go. Okay. Oh, it is in the case. Okay. With the top off, it felt like I didn't have it in there. And I was like, where did I put it? Nope, it's in there. I just missed it the first time. How can you miss a phone? Very easily. You don't pay attention. 
I can't afford to pay attention. I'm saving up to buy the way. Oops. Let's see what's that doing there. All right, so everything looks good there. All right. And trim that went nicely. Get over here. And do the drop down feed through. It's twisting at a weird angle. And there we go. Looks good. Let's bring the camera over so you guys can see the tying of the knot. Which I realize is probably not all that interesting, but you guys don't see a ton on these setup strings, which I apologize for. And there's two. One more, and we can warp the or we can wrap this one up and weave it in. There we go. Now move it back and rolling it up. Okay, I see the middle there. Let's go ahead and Lark's head this end. And I'll just let it hang. I'll grab the other one. Nice to take holds well enough that I can walk to pick up the other end and not have the first end fall to the floor. Okay, let's lark said this end. Hey, Cookie Mon Steve. Yep, we're making really good progress uh, on this one. Um, this, I believe, is 42, which is our official halfway point. All right. So, um, that one belongs there. Let's get this a little more even. It's probably a bit too far over just yet. Okay, so flags there. This goes behind and then up over. So under the first, over the second, under the third over the fourth, oops, passing that through, one there, let's see, that one looks like it might be having a tension issue, it's also wrapped pretty tight around another one, that might be why it was having the issue, okay, so over four, under five, over six, under seven, over eight, under nine, over ten, and under eleven. All right, let's put this over here, do a quick check. And if you can see, it's a nice even weave pattern. Haven't missed any. Yep, they're all good. Pull this one back up. It should be all right. And hmm. let's go ahead and pull this one back just a little bit so it's not covering the other one too much. There we go. All right. And pull off the oldest flag. All right, so we are exactly four and a half hours, or yeah, four and a half hours in. So theoretically, the upper time limit, if I don't have a problem of getting this set up, is nine hours. Catch up here. I think probably I'm. Um, 
mix between um, Ian and Jeff. Um, I think my humor probably matches those fairly closely. I tend to do the dry type of comments. Um, I'm not really so much for the uh, kind of um, shock type for um, Nick. Um, Rob, I don't really know if I've got a strong feeling on how his humor goes uh, as far as matching. He seems to be uh, more just kind of observational and re reactive to Ian's uh, humor. I could be wrong on that, but that's just kind of the impression I've got. All right, so white is the next one. Another thing about getting this set up fairly soon that'll be helpful is okay. I just yep white next. Okay, sorry. It's really easy to lose track if I'm distracted by other things. Um, so let's see. This is kind of caught under the magnet here. Let's set that up. There we go. Um, once I get this set up, I'm hoping to be able to spend a little more time in the shop working on some of the other projects I need to do there. I'm starting to fall behind on that. I haven't actually 3D printed anything since before I went on vacation. So I'm looking forward to doing some of that as well. All right. Well, it's not having any issue this time. That's good. Um, I think my main thing with comedy is as long as it's not mean uh, or not mean to people who deserve, you know, theoretically deserve having some karma thrown their way, um, I'll usually enjoy it. I don't like it if it's just like bullying type comedy. I, as far as the uh, getting into the, uh, uh, yeah, needed to try and set this one again. Um, not to get too much into the uh, comedy uh, slash uh, drama. I really don't care for uh, Dick Masterson's style of humor. Um, I know some people find those things funny, but for me, it's just kind of like... Uh, Let's monetize being a, an asshole. But, yeah. It's not to say I dislike him. I just, it's not my uh, bottle of Mountain Dew, so to speak. Okay, yes, somebody was screaming outside the house. I have no idea why. That happens occasionally. One of these is a little short on the knot. Just hoping to get it through enough that it uh, ties off cleanly. Looks like it did. There we go. All right, let's finish getting ready to do our walk back. And walk back to the halfway point. Let's go ahead and put the flag on. As opposed to flagging of mead type thing. There's the clip on. Snip is done. 
Okay, since I'm having minor issues with the uh, way it's going through, let's see if we can't do it that way. Yep, that works. Now I don't have to twist it as much. And bring this around for the tie off. And once I sit down to work this one in, I'll catch up on chat. Got about seven hours of sleep last night. I've taken my full um, course of Pro Vigil, staged a little more to later in the day, so I'd be up later, and I am still sleepy. So I might have to end a little sooner than I'd like, but the fact I'm past the halfway point makes me very happy. Let's me know how fast I can... Uh, like we get the rest of this done. And there we go. All right. Roll up from the other end here. Yep, I can understand that, uh, Joanna Kate. Um, okay, other projects. The first one that I need to do is I need to make more taco dice. I have at least one outstanding order that I would like to have filled by Christmas. Uh, okay, drop them behind the back and up under the bottom. So that's under the first, over the second. Under the third, over the fourth, under the fifth, over the sixth, under the seventh, over the eighth, over nine, over ten, and under eleven. So, um, yeah, I need to do that. Um, I also need to. Uh, make, uh, put in a couple of uh, hemispherical depressions, aka making a bowl, two, or actually two bowls, into roughly a four by six by inch by two foot piece of wood. Um, I also need to make a candle mold. Well, not so much a candle mold. Um, just a second. Good. Love you, love. love you, dear. I'm leaving the serve out. Okay, thank you. And my wife's heading to work. Um, some friends of mine who uh, make chain mail need a uh, uh, a wax lube stick uh, for the machine they use. And apparently they either can't get the size they need commercially or it's ridiculously expensive. So they've been making them out of beeswax. But since they don't have a mold for it, they've been kind of making a temporary mold with um, paper. And it's been a pain in the butt for them. So I'm going to make one out of uh, high density polyethylene. Um, I need to machine that. And I also want to make the adaptation for my uh, braiding frame, not braiding frame, my warping frame uh, that I've been using here. So it's easier to use more than two colors with it. So, yep. Um, it happens sometimes, uh, with Nick, I, I tend to enjoy his general content and a lot of his uh, philosophies on how the law should work, uh, that I go ahead and put up with the minor annoyances. Plus I've actually met him in person. Admittedly, it wasn't for very long, but I do like the guy. Okay, so we're ready for blue next. 
fruit and blow my nose. And that's what we're doing. Blue next. Stage the Tama. Yep, I've got 40 Tama left to go. So I'm doing pretty good here. But I do think I'm probably going to wind up ending this stream after the next couple of sets. Are done. All right, so blue, bring it from the clip. Make sure I got all, all of them going. Yep, that's in the way there. All right, so walk this back here and so, um, next stream is going to be Saturday. Uh, Friday, I can't stream before my wife wakes up, and after she's up, I've only got a few hours until uh, Friday Night Frenzy, and I'm trying not to run against that one. I figured eventually I'm going to have to. Uh, as time goes on, more people I do braids for, um, the schedule is just going to conflict, and I understand that as a YouTube content creator, um, you got to like stream when you have to stream because the more interconnected you get the less opportunities you've got that don't conflict against somebody and uh, if you don't conflict against anybody either you have no friends or other people that you stream as well um, or you just can't stream at all and then you don't do anything anymore so but yeah, for when I'm when I've done people's braids, uh, I'm doing them. I will do my best not to uh, conflict with their streams. There we go. And I'm not trying to cannibalize their audience. Um, it's just I do something that's a bit different than them, even though I am quote unquote law to adjacent. Um, but it's kind of like a chance to uh, introduce myself to their audience. And for those that are interested in the stuff I do, hey, now they know where to see it. If they're not interested, that's perfectly fine, too. Because I don't feel I have an, anybody has an obligation to watch me. But if I'm entertaining enough or interesting enough for whatever reason, hopefully they will. And I have definitely tried to uh, get myself um, to an understanding of what, you know, YouTube streamer culture is so that if I, I'm either comfortable with it, because uh, if I'm not, it's just going to lead to frustration for me because it's not going to change around my expectations. Oops. Got to move this over here. All right, let's tie this one off. Let's make sure that it's like reasonably close to the end. There we go. And one. And two. And There we go. Let's move that back. Let's go ahead and roll this one up. Okay, that's probably enough on this side. All righty. Oh, uh, my wife who said uh, Serbia is out. That is the cat that we rescued from the uh, campground. 
It's short for Cerberus because he has a spot on his back. Um, I will tell my, uh, uh, my, or let me, let me get this in and I will bring up and respond to the specific chat. So, all right. So, Lark's head here. And, okay. Down behind, under, and then so under one, over two, under three, over four, under five, over six, under seven, over eight, under nine, over ten, under eleven, and over twelve. All right. And let's take a look. Yep, that's nice and even. And let's bring that up. There we go. Oops. That one needs to be down there, not on top, because it's blue. And okay. Let's take off the oldest flag. Looks like I missed one on the top. Let's bring that one into compliance. So one, two, and three. Oh, nope. They just, just looked like there were more. All right, so that was already in compliance. There we go. Let me catch up on chat. Yep, uh, I tend to only watch my favorites. And the other thing I tend to listen to on YouTube a lot uh, is... Reddit reader, Reddit readers for like malicious compliance, tales from tech support, uh, entitled parents, entitled people, things like that. Yes, indeed, I do like working with it. It is a dream to machine. You don't have to do a conventional milling pass to get a decent finish on the final pass, um, and chips come off easily, and it doesn't smell horrible like some of the other plastics when you're machining them. But yeah, it's a fun material to work with. I, I like machining in uh, high density. So um, we did recycle it at my work. We, we used to recycle PVC, uh, polypropylene, uh, Lexan, or polycarbonate, high density polyethylene, and ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, uh, I think it's polyethylene. Anyway, um, but apparently we're only getting uh, mostly PVC and occasionally polypro that will be recycled. And the annoying thing is, is that we don't get paid for it. We just collect it. You know, we save it for the, the recyclers and we can't get people to pick it up. It's kind of frustrating. Anyway, sorry about that. I will let her know since you said it was for my wife. I will probably stream some of the other projects. Um, I have a computer out there. Actually, I have two, and uh, I need to probably get another camera because it's getting, it gets to be a pain to move cameras from place to place regularly. So, um, but yeah, I do plan to uh, stream some of that stuff. I, if you look back through, I've got some shop streams up, but I do plan on doing that. Whoops, clicked on the wrong one. Thank you very much, David Nelson. Uh, that, I take that as a high compliment. Actually, I don't have too much of an uh, issue machining acetyl slash Delrin. Um, it does require a conventional milling pass, but the smell doesn't bother me when it's machined and it gets a nice finish on it. Um, it's kind of like it, it machines similar to nylon, only not quite as hard and doesn't smell quite as bad as machining nylon does. The nylon, it's not too bad to machine either. But yeah, the usual stuff in the shop I work in, we do a lot. We do most of it in PVC. We also do a lot in Vivac, which is PETG. Um, for a lot of that stuff, we're making like uh, sneeze guards and shields for foodstuffs. So we do a lot of like grooving and bending. Um, we also... Oh, 
a good bit yawning here. Um, uh, we do a lot in uh, high density um, or fair amount in high density, decent amount in polypro, a lot of it natural, uh, some of it white. Um, we also use um, uh, uh, we have a, a regular job we do a lot of in black copoly. Um, uh, I don't think it's homopolymer, but it's 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 a polypro. Um, and then we also do a moderate amounts in UHMW um, and Delrin, nylon, um, some acrylic, not a whole lot of acrylic. Um, and then occasionally some other more exotic materials. You have a good one, Sherry. Well, I hope to see you on the next stream. You have a nice night. Oh, definitely. We always do a conventional milling pass for Delrin. It makes it uh, the finish a lot nicer. Um, with Delrin, we tend to, uh, uh, since it's usually a little, uh, the, this, the material we get in is a little over nominal in size, we tend to do uh, decking passes, you know, face, facing passes. Uh, we call it decking because we're using um, uh, MDF uh, boards uh, on top of vacuum tables. And so we, you know, do a decking pass to, to clean up the face on that. And so if we're doing it on the top of material, even though it's a facing pass, we also call it decking. But we also tend to get, you know, orders for like five-eighths uh, material, you know, five-eighths parts in height and you know we get like it in three quarter half inch and we tend not to get as it's harder to get the intermediate sizes so we tend to machine it down to the size we need before doing the rest of the work um but yeah delrin in my experience uh for for what we do uh we usually clean it up along the edges with three eighths or half inch uh four flute uh, tungsten carbide end mills, usually uncoated, and we run them at about 12,000 RPM, and we do our roughing passes about 180 inches a minute, and we do our finishing passes somewhere around 140 to 100 inches a minute for the final pass. We take like a 10 thou and then a 5 thou final pass uh, as conventional milling cut. I uh, hope that wasn't too much uh, info dump for you, but uh, I try and be helpful where I can. Okay, let's see. Let me go ahead and do a white one, and I think I'll call it a nine. So three, six, nine. So I'll be 48, so I'll be a little over halfway through. And let's take about five hours. So I'll take a look at how much I've actually done tonight, because my first one I was doing more setup to, to do this than actually working it up. And all right, so I am doing Doing white. Okay, just making sure because I keep forgetting from standing up to going over here to do it. And yeah, that's good there. No reason I can't restage it on the side of the top of the eye as opposed to on the warping frame. All right, so it looks like that is a little uneven. But I got it. Okay, yep. Even now. All right. Feels like something. One of them's cut. All right, which one is that? Okay, so it's on this. Yep, it's this one here. There we go. Now it's going free. Okay. It's also getting a bit warm up here. I don't want to turn on the fan while I'm doing this. 
because it tends to blow uh, the silk around before I get it tied off. And uh, that gets to be a little, an exercise in frustration. So my guess is I will probably stream about 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We'll just about get back to Eastern Standard Time in another month or two. Oh, and I was looking back over as far as watch hours go. It looks like until like the 1st of November or so, um, I have almost no watch hours from last year in that time frame per day. So it should not, um, I'm not going to have to deal with uh, having the tail end dropping off for the last year's worth of, you know, for the, uh, the, the one year window that they use to measure, uh, watch hours. So everything we do for about the next six weeks or so, uh, be good on its own. Won't have to you know, not really compensate, but won't have to deal with the fact that the back end is taking away like the Lingoliers. Oh, speaking of humor, um, Larry Correa has been uh, occasionally dunking on Stephen King on Twitter slash X when Stephen King says something that he finds to be exceptionally stupid. Uh, But then again, I don't think much of Stephen King's politics. Um, so I enjoy that, but that may be entirely due to the partisan side of that. But I also like Larry Crea's humor in general. Admittedly, he does tend to go uh, for the kill shot fairly early in his online arguments. But that's because he's been doing it long enough that he pretty much knows how the arguments are going. Uh, Pretty much when they start by the uh, types of comments he gets so i can understand i've watched him for probably since 2012. i originally stumbled across him from uh, his uh, uh, firearms rights essays uh, and got to reading his uh, fiction work from that and thoroughly enjoyed his fiction work as well so um, I recommend him as an author for people who like uh, modern fantasy uh, of the uh, non-romance variety, or urban fantasy of the non-romance variety. His primary series is Monster Hunter International, which deals with the stories of um, people who, in a world full of monster movies, um, their philosophy is... Uh, Fight evil, kill the monsters, and get paid. Uh, basically, in that uh, world, uh, huh, that one looks like I got one that's. Huh, might have to retention this. I'm going to unroll it real quick and pull it even so that uh, I don't have thread hanging out loose on one. Okay, there we go. It's just. I might have to go ahead and uh, bring out super glue and glue the end so it's even, but it should be good for now. Okay, anyway, um, so yeah, in, in the story, it's basically a world where every single movie monster potentially exists. Uh, you know, primarily you've got uh, vampires, uh, Zombies, you know, all types of undead monsters. You have um, werewolves, um, fish monsters, giant spiders. Uh, like I said, pretty much anything you can think of that's a movie monster. Um, and in that universe, there is. Uh, a government fund that will pay people who hunt monsters and gives them a bounty on the type of monster, how dangerous it is um, that they take out. Um, 
There is a government agency called the Monster Control Bureau, and their goal is to um, keep the ordinary person from being aware that there is monsters. But once you run across them, uh, people either try and forget it, or if they uh, are a little more proactive, they get recruited by monster hunting agencies. Now that they can be, you know, now that they're aware of it, they don't have to hide it from from them, so to speak. So they've got other people around that know about monsters, uh, way to deal with it a little better. And uh, they, you know, different uh, municipalities around the world, around the U.S. or whatnot, uh, have people on them that are aware that, you know, these monsters are real. And uh, when something comes up, they get a hold of uh, one of these companies where they usually have a contract with them. They come in, clear out the monsters, uh, submit their bill to the government in addition to whatever uh, they had from the local, you know, whoever called them in. And uh, been interesting stories. I like them. But it originally got started with the, you know, what would monster movies be like if, uh, you know, gun people were in them? <laughs> ah. Now, admittedly, there are some monsters that, you know, the guns don't work on. Uh, and there's other ways they deal with them. <laughs> But uh, it's an enjoyable series. It's well written. First book is kind of gun porn, but after that one, I mean, it was originally written to sell to people on gun forums. But after the first one, it moves more into like just generalized urban fantasy. And Larry's a really good writer, uh, so it's fun to read his work. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11 and 12, so 24. We have 48 Thomas set up, which means we need um, 36 left to go, and then we will be done. Hey, Francisco, nice to see you on. Sorry about that. Um, all right, let me catch up with chat real quick before I go. Congrats, congrats Gwen. That's wonderful to hear. Okay, um, the uh, the Tama I have are injection molded acrylic that I put steel cores in. Um, so I'm hopefully I can, was able to help some. I'm glad that uh, pattern is a nice one for you. I'm assuming that's Larry Korea, uh, but yeah, it's spelled C O R R E I A. Yes, it has three vowels in a row. Uh, and it's just pronounced like the country Korea. No, that's not. He's from Portuguese descent, and that is not the actual Portuguese pronunciation of the word, but that's the way his family has pronounced it since they immigrated. Francesca, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and have to be ending it now. I've been on for about three hours, and for some reason, I've been really sleepy today. I did take my medicine to stay awake, but I think I'm just... I'm going to have to call it a night, and uh, my next stream will be Saturday morning, uh, about 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you very much. And I think I've covered that I'm going to be ending the stream. So, oh, I forgot to check uh, uh, Rumble the entire time. Let me go ahead and quickly look over there. Got two people watching. Not sure how many were on, but nobody chatted over there. All right, so looks like we're good to go. Um, thank you, everybody who came on. A special thanks to Danny, on, Danny from Danny on Direct. Um, appreciate her coming in. This is her braid, and it's nice to been able to chat with her. Made uh, stream a much nicer experience for me. Hopefully, nicer for you folks as well. And if you get a chance, her uh, channel's link is in the dis uh, the stream description. Please feel free to go there like and subscribe to her content if you like it and if you like my content please like subscribe and share and we will see you folks again saturday so everybody have a good night stay safe and happy braiding <laughs>